as a preliminary matter, um, I am the chair of the Arlington School Committee. Permit me to, uh, we'll do attendance in a minute. This open meeting of the Arlington School Committee is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020 due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. In order to mitigate transmission, we have been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings. And as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order, which you can find posted with agenda materials for this meeting, allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation. This meeting will feature public participation. For this meeting, the Arlington School Committee is convening via Zoom as posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. Please note this meeting is being recorded and that some attendees are participating via video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that others may be able to see you and take care not to screen share your computer. Anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. All of the materials for this meeting, except any executive session materials, are available on the Novus Agenda dashboard. We recommend members of the public follow the agenda as posted on Novus, unless I note otherwise. We are now, okay, uh, once we get to the first item on the agenda, the ground rules will be that I will introduce each speaker on the agenda after they conclude their remarks. I will go down the list of members inviting each by name to provide any comment questions or motions. Please hold until your name is called further. Please remember to mute your phone or computer when you are not speaking. Please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. For any response, please wait until the chair yields the floor to you and state your name before speaking. If members wish to engage in colloquy with other members, please do so through the chair, taking care to identify yourself. Um, there will not be public comment on specific items. Each vote taken at this meeting will be conducted via a roll call vote. So let's come back over here. And, oh, look, you can't see me. Huh, sorry, guys. Um, all right, so let's do, um, let's do attendance. So, um, Ms. Exton is not going to be here for the first part of our meeting tonight. She um, is at the open house for her school, um, but she'll be joining us later on. Um, so after her, um, Mr. Cardin. Yes, I'm here. Um, Dr. Allison Ampey. Here. Um, Ms. Steelman. Here. Mr. Schlickman. Good evening. Mr. Hainer. Here. Um, and from the AEA tonight, we have Ms. Fernandez. Here. Great. Um, and then uh, Dr. Bodie. Present. Uh, Dr. McNeil. Here. Mr. Mason. Present. Mr. Spiegel. Here. Uh, Ms. Elmer. Here. All right. And then we have um, from we have some of our principals and directors here. So I'll let you guys introduce yourselves. I see um, as we get to specific items on the agenda. I also see Ms. Thomas from Metco. I know she's on the agenda. Can you hear me, Ms. Thomas? I should have well. Can you hear me? I can. Yep. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so the first item on the agenda is public comment and there were no signups for public comment tonight. So we can move on to the fall opening update. Um, Dr. Bodie and Dr. McNeil. All right. Thank you, Ms. Morgan. Uh, this evening we have um, many of our uh, principals here who are going to talk to what's been going well and what are some of the concerns as we have uh, been implementing both the hybrid program and the remote academy. Um, uh, uh, Ms. Fitzgerald, could you let uh, Madame Pierre Maxwell in? I think she's having trouble coming in. She's um, in. She's in. Oh, she's in. Okay. Uh, for the same reason, <laughs> for the same reason, Ms. Exton uh, needs to be late. Uh, uh, Madame, also needs to leave by seven. So I'm going to ask her if she would begin and then we'll go to the elementary 
uh, Addison and the high school in terms of reports about uh, the, uh, the programs to date. Thank you, Dr. Bodhi. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I am Madame Pierre Maxwell, the principal of the Gibbs School, and uh, I'm here to report we had a very be nice beginning with the students. Um, the students were excited to start school, and we were extremely happy to have them returning to the building, and uh, things went really smoothly with uh, organizing the children, teaching them the new expectations. I think one of our biggest worries were how well were they going to do with the mask on? And this has really been lovely. Uh, just about all of the kids are quite adjusted to wearing the mask. We're not having any challenges with that. They're also receiving regular mask break uh, in the morning and also after lunch and sometimes in the afternoon. So this has been going really well. Um, the remote learning uh, classes and the uh, hybrid classes are going well. Of course, uh, we have some challenges where, especially the Wednesday, uh, I recall uh, Miss Morgan calling it the magic Wednesday. So we're still ironing out some of the challenges with the Wednesday, uh, working specifically with our band chorus and orchestra classes and trying to still figuring this out, making it a smooth transition for the children from their regular core classes on that Wednesday. So that's something that's still on the table. We're working with our staff, uh, our parents, to make sure that uh, we bring clarity to that Wednesday in regard to the BCO. Uh, otherwise, uh, things are going really well. We have our four-day students uh, filing in. We had to make a few phone calls to tweak, make some changes, but uh, right now, all of our uh, special education liaison teachers and the TAs are assigned. We know specifically what are we doing with the children on their second two days in the building. So uh, it's it's working out real smooth. Um, is it perfect? No. Uh, it is the first time we're doing a hybrid program in all remote. So there are random things that are being brought to our attention and we're working on making them better. But otherwise, over, uh, overall, I think uh, the children are adjusting really well and the teachers are doing a good job um, getting to know them, working on the SEL piece, making sure that they are at ease and they are just learning as if we didn't have a COVID happening. Another plus is that the groups are quite small in the building. So that's a nice treat that the children are able to get that individualized attention for the two days they are in front of the teachers and therefore are able to better access the lessons that are placed on their um, asynchronous day on Google Classrooms. Um, I think that's all I have to report for now. I'm sure something will come to mind when I hear the other uh, principal presenting, but um, it's going well overall. Uh, Ms. Morgan, do you want questions to wait to the end? Um, I think uh, the only thing is that Ms. Well, yeah, let's do questions. If there are specific questions from the committee about the Gibbs, I know I have one, maybe others do. Um, if we can do those now so that we can uh, bless and release her before seven, sounds like we've gotta, we gotta make sure that happens. Right. Okay, okay. Um, so um, Mr. Cardin, do you have any questions for Madame Pierre Maxwell? Uh, no, not at this time. Okay, Dr. Allison Ampey? Not at this time. Um, Mr. Thielman? No, I'm good, thank you. Uh, Mr. Schuchman? No, thank you, I'm happy to bless and release her. Mr. Hainer? Not at this time, thank you. Okay, um, so I had a couple of questions. Um, one of them was, um, Madame Pierre Maxwell, if you could talk to us um, about the, uh, the Wednesday schedule and the challenges with band, chorus, and orchestra, which are um, overlapping on top of, um, so for those who don't know, I have two, I have twins at the Gibbs um, who are both in band, and the way that our Wednesdays work at our house is that um, during first and second period, my oboist is in band, and uh, my non-oboist is goes to uh, I don't know what he goes to, uh, like ancient civ and science or something. Um, and then they switch, and the trumpeter goes to band, and he misses math and something else. Um, and I guess 
it, it seems like kind of a tricky way to do things. Um, I, I can tell you only from an end of, of two students, but it's, it's hard to miss classes. It's hard to miss academic classes. I feel like um, as a teacher, it would be hard to be missing students for, you know, you, you don't know if who you're going to get in math class. And so it's kind of hard to advance the curriculum when you're missing kids. Um, so I guess I, I'm curious about um, how, why this needed to happen this way. Um, if there's anything that we can do about it, I appreciate the efforts to make things available to students. I appreciate the need to provide time for planning and professional development for educators um, at the end of the day on Wednesday. So it's not a lack of, uh, I don't have a lack of appreciation for those things, but to, to be running programs on top of each other is tricky, especially for 11 year olds. Okay. Uh, thank you uh, for the question. And I think in, in thinking out loud yourself, you have acknowledged some of the challenges of the Wednesday, which is that in order to offer, because first of all, Wednesday is a half a day. So we are doing live instructions um, virtually with the children from 8.30 until 11.45. So that, that compacted the day in itself on everything that we can offer within that first half of the day. So I think one thing we weren't extremely clear about with the parents is that if you in fact select to for your child to receive band chorus or orchestra that means they would not have enough time to attend whichever classes would be put into those 20 minutes block in the morning so one of the the teachers they do all know which students will be in front of them and which children are attending Ben chorus or orchestra, whether it's first, second or third block, because this is the, the three block of the morning. So if you are in those classes, they, they run for 50 minutes and therefore within that 15 minutes, there's about 225 minutes class, including transition. So on Wednesday morning, although we still have teachers who are teaching math, science, ancient civ and um, English language arts happening in the morning, they are not introducing anything new to the children. This is why when we presented that schedule the very first time, we call it the, it was called the wind block, which is what I need, or the MTSS, which is the multi-tiered system of support, meaning that we would not introduce anything new during that time for the fact that we know the teachers do not have all the children in front of them by their homeroom. And also this is the time where some of our kiddos who need extra intervention in math or in reading or OTPT, that's also the time where some of them are receiving that service. So even if it wasn't just a BCO issue, the teachers don't have the full children in front of them because that's one of the day we selected for the children who need something that's different from the core curriculum for that to take place into. So if you were to look at it from a different perspective, the twins are not missing ancient civ. They're selecting to go to band or to go to chorus or orchestra. And then so whatever it is that's happening in that 20 minutes in ancient civ in the morning will be posted in the afternoon. And it's something they can step facilitate. It's something that's probably a review of something they've already seen or something that's not essential to what they should learn and know as part of the ancient civ curriculum. I don't know if that helps so we're in conversation right now to figure out is it possible to offer ben chorus or orchestra in the afternoon this way the children would not miss anything at all even if that subject they're missing is not at the core of what they need to know or it's not something new but they're not missing it at all so if we can move bco after school in the afternoon uh, that's something we need to go back and perhaps have a conversation with the parents so they can be clear that that's the choice you're making and are you available to do so. So that's something we are considering, exploring. It's not a done deal yet. So, but the teachers understand in the meantime, until we figure it out, they would not introduce anything new in that Wednesday morning. And whatever it is that they do, it's something they will post in our uh, Google Classroom so the children can have access to it. Great, no, I mean, I, under, I understand it's challenging. It just sounds, um, I, yeah, I, 
from from our perspective as from my perspective as a as a parent of kids who are doing this and thinking about the student the teacher experience of you're teaching for 25 minutes and you got to get this thing up in the google classroom for the like who knows who you know the kids who weren't there and then you're managing the questions about that and um it it feels you know it it just feels like a lot so i'm glad to know that this is something that you guys acknowledge is is not ideal um and that um you know you're looking you're looking into it you know i can tell you my daughter is at the audison she has orchestra on her remote days obviously that's the best scenario um i can understand if if giving staffing and you know we only have so many people who can teach these courses um that may not be possible at the gibbs um but it does, you know, it does work really well because it gives her something to do on the days when, you know, when she's at home on her hybrid days. So I'm glad that you're talking about it. Um, it, you know, it's definitely a tricky piece. And I think it's really hard, especially with sixth graders who are 11 years old and they're really trying to diligently follow along with these new classes. They're not used to changing classes and then to all of a sudden miss two or one. And um, it can be, it just is, it's kind of jarring. So I, I appreciate that it's something you're working on. Dr. Allison Ampey. Thank you. I was just going to point out that there has been a history of Audison doing band and orchestra at the end of the day going into after school. So it, it has been done before, um, like seven, eight years ago at least. Um, but, it, but it has been done that way. And, and for the same reasons, it was, you know, just a mess to get it scheduled in and have everyone be able to attend. So Thank you. Jane, I have a Sorry, go ahead, Mr. Thielman. Um, <clears throat> um, my question is, on, on Wednesdays, how long, how, how much time does it take to clean the building? I know that's a cleaning day and the building's being cleaned. How many, um, do you have any sense of how many people are cleaning it and how long it takes them to do it? We have three custodians, uh, and I have not timed them to see what time they begin, what time they end, but I suppose perhaps a bit faster because most of the classrooms don't have teachers in them. They're able to move a little quicker. Yeah. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Thanks. That's all I wanted to know. Thank you. You're welcome. Are there any other questions for um, Madame Pierre Maxwell? And then we know she needs to go. Look, I need to look on the other page. Okay, I think we're good. Thank you so much for coming uh, to be with us tonight. It's um, we're it's really good to have you here. So thank you. You are welcome. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Right. Thank right. you. So back to you, Dr. Bodhi. Um, I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Michael Hanna and Ms. Kate Perez, who is the principal Hardy, and Dr. Hanna of Stratton to talk about, um, they're going to be representing their elementary uh, colleagues and talking about what has been going well and what are some challenges we still face. Kate, uh, are we going to go first? I'm sorry if I forgot that. Sorry, no, I thought you were going to go first, Dr. All right, fair enough, that I will. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to uh, first, uh, give recognition and, and really um, some uh, unfiltered praise to all of the, the faculty and staff um, of all of our elementary schools. Um, their flexibility and professionalism and commitment uh, in the opening of the school year uh, is just really um, kind of took my breath away at different moments. Some of the things that they did with a smile on their face. Um, it was obviously all in the joy of being able to welcome children back. Um, I know that it's been a long time, um, and so uh, I just want to recognize uh, on behalf of all my elementary colleagues uh, how, how pleased we were to be starting again, and especially on-site. Uh, the on-site uh, programming launch uh, had just enormous challenges and variables that we never thought of, um, and we have quite simply launched really well on-site. Um, there's uh, uh, complications, as you all are really well aware of. Um, I also want to give recognition uh, to our students, to our to our children, the grades K through five. Um, I'm not sure if any of them are watching tonight necessarily, but uh, maybe they can have it passed along to them um, by their parents. How proud we are of them and how thoughtful they are in keeping one another safe 
and uh, still having a great school day every every day on site. And um, and I finally just want to thank our uh, and recognize our custodial staff, uh, maintenance custodial staff, uh, who are also um, bending and and uh, not breaking uh, under the uh, stress and of this kind of new way of doing things. And, and we so appreciate uh, all of their energy and commitment. Uh, again, the, the instructional programming has been uh, launched well. Um, we have uh, gotten going uh, in the schools quicker than I think we ever uh, thought we would. Uh, I met, passed along an email to the Stratton families that, frankly, I've just looked around after the first week and was surprised at how how well the engine was running and, and uh, uh, again, was just so delighted to be working with all the people I work with. Um, we know that very well the, the places that we're still working, uh, where we need to focus. Um, we brought it up uh, here and in other contexts that uh, that really is the uh, remote side of the hybrid program. Um, and I just wanna be a little bit more particular about that and talking to my, my principal friends this afternoon and, and also in, in uh, jumping into uh, classrooms that are in Google Classroom online on remote days. I think that what I'm hearing that, that families would uh, like us to focus on is the uh, structure and schedule and kind of to-do lists for the children while they're in uh, that remote side of the hybrid program. Um, so we are, are putting a lot of energy into that. Um, we have an enormous uh, inventory now uh, building up of resources from uh, Dr. McNeil and the, the directors of curriculum, the instructional coaches. They are working so hard to be filling out the remote side of the hybrid program. And uh, we, well, our next step and hopefully final step would be to operationalize all of those um, uh, wonderful resources. And, and Dr. McNeil just shared with us a um, an innovative way to get our curriculum experts and our teachers together to make that remote side of the hybrid program even more rich and mirror as close as possible uh, the days that we have on site. So we know that that is um, indeed our, our challenge and we're getting better every day, um, but I just want to make it clear to families that we understand that the, the most pressing petition is to have uh, um, a structure and something that, that families can easily understand as the, the, uh, um, the game plan for each day that the children are at home. Um, so uh, with that, I'll let uh, Ms. Parrots talk a bit um, about other things that are happening at our elementary launch. Absolutely, and I, I echo everything that Dr. Hannah just said, and you know, I, I, I wish that what we could do is have more uh, visitors in our school. Of course, we can't do that so that you could see on site, like Dr. Hannah is talking about, just how um, easily it seemed that everyone fell into these new routines. I think that, that we were worried about the things like the mask wearing and the distancing and the, the management of the people within the facility, but it has not been the, the stress and the strain that we thought it might be. People have been very supportive. And I think um, all of the work that families did at home to help their children to be ready to come into that environment um, really helped a great deal. So thank you for that as well. Um, there certainly have been some things that have been uh, bumps along the way that we're working our way through. I think um, we knew that there would be challenges for sure. And I think there have been some specific pieces of our plan for technology um, that have uh, been difficult, but our technology department, our tech people, and our digital learning people have been working just round the clock so hard, and the teachers themselves too, helping to support the students. And I think the families also just really trying to lend their expertise to make the technology piece of this work. Um, Zoom was something that we were a little bit nervous about, you know, bringing in for, for many reasons, but then it has gone very smoothly and that's great. Um, and then other platforms that we are looking at, different tools that we think will eventually um, help us to do our work um, more effortlessly have given us some, some struggle. Um, there's um, a tool called uh, Seesaw that's especially um, 
should be especially well received by um, students and families in the younger grades when it is working appropriately. Um, it wasn't working quite well with Clever, which is something else that it was meant to be an organizational tool for all of our uh, various learning platforms. And so, but I think that it, we're getting very close to making that all come together in a way that is um, functioning in the way it should be. I was able to see a fifth grade classroom use the Clever um, to organize all the different tools and the children um, when it was up and going for them, it really was um, very, very helpful. And I think it will help to streamline the process um, quite a bit for everyone. So that's great. And we also, we um, distributed many, many, many devices, uh, the new iPads for the kindergarten through second grade, um, the Chromebooks for um, the older students. And I think that's really helping us a great deal to make sure everybody has access to um, the learning that is, that is going on. Um, <clears throat> so I think another thing to think about though too is um, something that we have talked about here before, which is our staffing and the work that we're doing to make sure that we're completely supported, especially with paraprofessionals and other support staff at our elementary schools. Um, and we are making progress on that. Um, we just had a brand new kindergarten TA start at Hardy on Tuesday and we welcome her, so that was great. Um, but we are still moving slowly along um, in that goal of being fully staffed. And uh, we're talking to each other as administrators, really thinking about what we had shared with all of you about how, you know, at the beginning of November, we were really hoping to be able to assess um, our staffing levels and how uh, that is affecting our programming. And so, you know, we're having those conversations and we'll continue to have them and present them to you about how that's going. Um, and about what level of staff is really necessary to safely um, support the um, school buildings, you know, maintaining that, um, that full level of programming all of the hours that we would like to be in school. Um, so those are a few things that we're thinking about, but also from the, um, the other in the success column, just to end, we had our first PTO meeting at Hardy last night, and it was a great event um, on Zoom but a lot of people are able to participate. And I think the enthusiasm for the school year is definitely there, which is nice, even though it is difficult and it is different at times. And I think we worry about our communities um, not staying connected um, and maintaining you know, that re the remote academy and the children who were in person and all of the teachers involved. And I think that the desire to maintain that strong community is definitely there. Um, so we're feeling very optimistic about this year being uh, a really positive one, even though it is very different than what we expected. So thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I, I also want to extend my appreciation to all the principals and administrators, because without their hard work and planning, we would not be in the position we are today. So thank you. Um, we also have um, our two coordinators for the remote program here, but I don't know if you would like to have questions uh, for Ms. Paris and Dr. Hannah before we move to that. Let's do that. That worked. That worked well with the Gibbs, right? So let's let's try it. Um, so, Mr. Cardin. Uh, thank you. Thanks for the update. Um, so I, I guess we'll get into it in the hiring update a little bit more, but I, I'm still curious about how short we are as far as staff to deliver programming for the students that are in the building under the current hours, because I, I understand that we're still short some TAs for special education. Um, and then how are we anywhere on the map at all to adding back that 45 minutes for, for the school day? I don't know if we want to table that for the personnel update or, or discuss that now. Ms. Morgan, can I speak? Yeah, please. Um, we uh, just this afternoon, we made a commitment, the elementary principal team to uh, get together early next week to uh, make a sort of a, a sketch of what that tipping point would be. Um, uh, we, we, we have to 
uh, sort of take a look. There, there was a lot of shifting that still went on even as we began the year. Um, so we feel like as we're onboarding people, uh, we're now in a position where we can actually talk about that and, and talk about uh, what, what uh, kind of personnel we would need and even maybe even think innovatively about um, uh, uh, paraprofessionals being hired in both uh, the, um, the on-site programming and for off-site programming and just getting creative, maybe even off-site programming for another school with, with on-site programming for one school. Obviously, we don't want to do on-site for two schools, but um, we're, we're going to open all of that up and, and try to articulate where we feel like once we get to it, it'd be a benchmark for us to, to move to a full school day. Great. Thank you. And my other question is, um, if we've talked with other towns about, you know, almost all, almost all of the towns that are open and hybrid have the same basic schedule that we do, except for Lexington. So what, what are they doing? You know, and, and I know some are, are very similar to us. It's asynchronous mostly, but how are they structuring those remote days, uh, perhaps in a manner, things that we can perhaps, have we talked with them to see if there's anything we can learn from them and they might be doing differently or, or better? Yeah, and that, and that's a very good question, and it's something that we do have conversations about with um, our colleagues in other districts um, quite a lot, actually. And I think, um, from my perspective, I feel that um, in Arlington, we're actually trying to do even more than some of our colleagues in other districts are doing, and trying to maintain at least some connection with a teacher in that live environment. Um, and, and that's part of um, our commitment to that is really trying to maintain that. Um, and so, but that's hard. I, you know, I know that there are a lot of districts where it really is completely that the students are just following along with the schedule on those days and there aren't the, uh, the specials like art and music and PE. There aren't the live morning check-ins um, and those um, commitments to trying to have as we go through the year, some service that might be happening for students who, who require that with a person uh, and not have it all be recorded. So I think we've created a challenge for ourselves, but it's a really, it's a good challenge. It's an important challenge and we wanna keep working towards that. Um, Dr. Hannah, I don't know if you wanna add anything to that. Yeah, yeah, I actually, I, I, um, I know I mentioned this in another context, we were able to uh, um, connect with a, um, an undergraduate school of education to uh, onboard 19 undergrad uh, pre-practicum students to help out and be um, uh, just remote because they're undergrad students, they're not going to be able to leave campus, but they're in three days a week um, in the remote setting uh, to uh, connect with students and lead small groups. And so it's, it's that kind of commitment that we have to as much as possible um, get the kind of programming offsite that we have on site. And as Kate said, I, I, you know, I've got a lot of different connections around the state in a lot of different contexts. And that, that is rare. It is rare to be aiming for that because it's a, it's a little bit elusive, if not impossible, but um, you know, our, fantastic faculties are up for it and really want to do it and are really sweating it and will continue to do so, I'm sure. I, I would add one comment. I've actually had um, questions from other districts asking how we're able to do what we're doing. So actually, I think what we're seeing is actually many districts looking to Arlington for how to program those remote days. Great, thank you. Dr. Allison Ampey. Mr. Cardin asked one of my questions. Um, so I just have the smaller one. I hear still of some families who are realizing they need either iPads or Chromebooks. And I'm wondering, I know we've had pickup days and everything, but where, where should we send them if we see someone who's in that position? Yes, to us, to the principals, for sure because we still, we continue to connect people. Um, so just because distribution days have passed does not mean that, that you're out of luck. Like just connect with us and let us help you. And if you're having trouble with devices that you picked up or that you have already at home, just let us know because we wanna support you in making that work. Great, thank you very much. 
Mr. Thielman. Yes, hi. Uh, I want to thank uh, everyone <clears throat> who's uh, gotten the remote and uh, the, the hybrid program off the ground this year. I mean, I, the parents that I'm speaking with uh, generally are relieved that their kids are back in school, whether it's remote or hybrid. And so it's a good thing it's in this, and I think people in general feel better. Um, uh, I, I said we had a community relations meeting last week, and I said there was a quote by uh, Nelson Mandela that I, I like to refer to, um, <clears throat> and that is that he said that it's it always seems impossible until it is done. And so I, I mean I think there were a lot of conversations this summer about how challenging this would be, um, and and how impossible it would be from from some quarters, but you know I think. It's not done yet. I know it's not done yet, <clears throat> but I do think there's a, there's a lot of good feelings uh, on the part of people um, in the community because you you kind of you know you're we're teaching we're learning, kids are advancing uh, the in the curriculum. So on behalf of lots of parents in the community, I just want to thank you, um, <clears throat> and thank all the staff for their hard work. Um, but you know the general the general concern that seems to come up um, <clears throat> in conversations with people has not been measured by any data, not been uh, examined or, or there's no data to, to support anything at this point. And I know uh, we're talking about doing a parent survey later in the, the semester, but <clears throat> is that um, the, the Wednesdays um, uh, could use more activities and then the days when the student, the, when the hybrid students are not uh, in class, um, uh, there are, uh, you know, there are, there are gaps First, in some cases, um, in terms of time, uh, learning time. And so I guess I would just say that um, since this is a new model, it's only, it's less, you know, I don't know, it's not even a month old. Uh, I just would, I would say, my question is, you know, to what extent are you examining this? Um, what kind of data are you looking at to reach your conclusions about um, the extent to which uh, students are getting a lot out of Wednesdays, Thursdays and Fridays if they're a group or the other way. Um, and just, I just maybe share a little bit about your thinking and how you're analyzing um, those days when remote students, I'm sorry, when, when the Wednesdays in general for students, and then uh, those days when hybrid learners are not in school. Ms. Morgan is okay. Um, yeah, Mr. Thielman, I think that we are looking, happily we have a common platform in Google Classroom. I know that we've, we've got something else going uh, soon in kindergarten and I appreciate the, the families of the kindergarten families for their patience. But, um, but we looked to those uh, now familiar frameworks to really take a look at both the course stream and then also the assignments tab as well just to see uh, what it is. And, and again, our, our benchmark is really what it is that might happen on, a, on an on-site day. You know, and do we see there something that's mirroring the experience of children? Now, we know that that's a little disingenuous. We can't have exactly the same thing, but the amount of rigor and the amount of demand and the amount of engagement, that's what we're gonna aim for. Um, and I think that, that one thing that we really kind of came to today, just as an admin team, is a, uh, a more direct line of our instructional coaches being able to help our um, uh, general ed teachers in designing that time. Uh, Dr. McNeil's helped to create an, an, a uh, sort of a platform that, that's going to work. I mean, it was, we, we were just getting used to our instructional coaches kind of parachuting into classrooms and, and collaborating that way, and, uh, and now here we are. So I think that with the help of the coaches to really take all of the curriculum resources and say, okay, now this is, this is how you make it into a rich couple of days um, for the students. I think that we're really going to um, improve programming as the year goes on. Um, but just, just know that it's clear to all of us that that's the, the uh, point of focus uh, for, for improvement going forward, for sure. Mm -hmm. And I think just to add to that too, you know, these, these different digital tools that we've been, um, to, not that we've been developing, but that we've been introducing, um, I think that as those become things that the children are really engaging with and understanding how to use a little bit better, and then also 
families at home too. So we had received the feedback from people, which I think is, is great feedback that families would like to have a little bit more, um, you know, PD of their own on this kind of work. And so understanding like, how do I use this? What is the purpose of this? Um, as far as the digital tools is concerned is something that's being developed now and will be coming out to families and, and introduced to families soon too. But I think also that's also been the same um, for all the rest of our curriculum too. And that, that's something that families have asked over time is really help us to understand like what is the objective of this work, digital or non-digital? What, where are we going with this? And that that will help us to be able to support students too. So, you know, really being those teams um, that are working together to support the kids. I think it really is all going to start to to click more into place. I'm going to ask a hypothetical question. Always dangerous, um, but let's assume that you know we could work out uh, that the. the everything is, is good from a safety perspective and a health, health and safety perspective. And um, somehow we can work out any issues about distancing. Would you, would you ever envision, would you ever, would you ever recommend to Dr. Bodhi, um, this is to Dr. Hannah, and Dr. Perret, Dr. Peretz, um, <clears throat> if you would ever recommend um, bringing back, say um, all K-1 and K, you know, K-1 students or say, you know, kindergarten, first grade, maybe even second grade, would you ever kind of bring, would you ever make a recommendation or kind of think, or, or is there a task force that is thinking about, can we bring back all of the kids, those who want to do remote, continue remote, but all the kids who want to be in person at some point this school year, those grades, K-1, 2, is that, is that ever, like, is, if you're talking about that, what do you think about that? It's too early in the year to make the recommendation to the superintendent, but would you ever do that? Well, it, it, it's interesting um, because those hypotheticals are things that we talk about all the time, all the time. And it has always been um, our goal, honestly, to, to have as many students in the building as we can. Um, and I think that, um, you know, we've created a plan that is really dedicated to meeting the needs of our students um, throughout this time of, of crisis, honestly, and I'm so incredibly proud of what we've done together. So uh, all of us as a community, home and in school, and I think that that, but that's what we want. Like we want kids back in school. I mean, this is going well and, and we can work through our problems, but we really do want them to be back in school. So I think as soon as we are able to do that safely, obviously safety comes first, we're going to want to do that. And some kind of phased approach may be what we do, and maybe the younger kids are the kids that need to come back to school sooner. But it's definitely too soon to actually entertain that kind of conversation right now. I, yeah, I know. I, I just want to know your thinking. That's all. But yes, if you could be a fly on the wall of our conversations, I mean that that we look at this from every angle and and you know look ahead as much as we can. Um, but that's been one of those um, tricky parts is that you just really can't anticipate. Um, what's going to happen. So, but I've been thinking a lot about flies lately since last night. I know, <laughs> right? I just love that too. <laughs> and thank you for calling me Dr. Parrots, but I'm not quite the doctor yet. Maybe we can so. just make that we'll happen see. by boat here, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Okay. All right. Thanks. That's all my questions. Appreciate your time. Uh, Mr. Schuchman. Yeah, thank you. And I, I, I like, uh, Mr. Thielman's idea of enabling us to confer doctorates. I, I, I think that we're just a, an outstanding institution. That'd be kind of fun. Uh, my question really is sort of the flip side to what Mr. Thielman asked, because one of the biggest concerns I had was in terms of the quality of kindergarten in that what we need to do for safety and distancing is contrary to a lot of the, th the things that I'm used to seeing in a really well-run kindergarten class. So can you describe to me how things are working in the context of kindergarten and if any of the theoretical discussions of bringing more kids in more often also included maybe doing half day rather than full day? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Mr. Scamman, I'm, I'm so so glad you asked that. We always have a particular care and concern for our youngest learners. Um, 
And you're quite right that, that our uh, five-year-olds, our kindergartners typically um, are very much interested in being in each other's company, uh, very physically close to one another. Um, that's just part of their developmental path is that, that they are, as we know from our programming commitments and tools of the mind that the children co-regulate one another and are in close proximity to do that. Um, as we laid out the kindergarten classrooms and pulled those trapezoid tables apart from one another, uh, we really were in some ways uh, doing the exact opposite of what uh, the tools program and responsive classroom would have us do. Um, having said that, another part of that developmental stage is uh, really interested in uh, following rules and really interested in helping their friends follow rules. Um, so in many ways, honestly, um, you want to have a kindergarten classroom uh, writ large in the, in the society <laughs> as far as uh, mask rules and staying apart from one another. Um, in many ways, their impulse control uh, is uh, in, in certain you know, contexts like this one stronger than even our older students in that it's made clear to them what's safe, what's expected, and they typically are ready to follow that. Um, but I have to say in watching the essential programming happening, most notably early literacy and early reading teaching going on live, um, I am so happy that those children are there to be receiving those first stages of phonological awareness and phonics um, from our teachers. And, and uh, I know that we're doing a, just a dynamite job. I met with our, the Stratton remote kindergarten teacher today talking about how we can make that happen via the screen as well. Um, just a lot of commitment from everybody, most notably the, the five-year-olds themselves uh, in making those classrooms run well. Yeah, I, I just, I, I would also say that to that point, uh, given the developmental instincts and urges of uh, kids at that level, uh, it's going to be interesting to follow these kids up through school to see what the difference in, in the expectations within a kindergarten classroom are going to have uh, developmentally and in terms of social emotional um, well-being for these kids as they're moving forward. Uh, obviously, we are where we are because of the uh, pandemic, and we can't change that reality that we're un operating under, but it's, it, there's going to be a lot of good research coming out of that. But uh, thank you for your thoughtful response. Uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Peretz, I'm sorry, I think I stepped on you as well. No, I was just, I was just going to add on that it, within the um, remote academy classes and when the children are at home um, on the hybrid days and they're interacting on the screen, I think that you would be incredibly impressed with how well the kindergarten students are doing with all of these things that we would also be teaching them in kindergarten, being able to take turns, being able to listen, being able to follow directions, being able to share and practice speaking. Um, I, I really, it has been a very short amount of time and I think they're doing a really great job. So um, it will be interesting though to see in the long term, I think especially that idea of the screens with all the research that we, you know, we've known for years about screens and development um, on young children. And so I think finding the balance between the screen and the off the screen learning is going to be something that we need to, to keep being um, paying attention to as we go along too. It's very interesting. The whole online environment does provide a, a fairly strict structure in terms of things like mute buttons and taking turns. Uh, if only we had that at the last presidential debate. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Hainer. Thank you all for the amount of work you've been doing. Uh, Mr. Cardin touched on one of my questions as well. We'll get to it in the hiring. Could either one of you or both of you speak to that 45 minute block, what your expectation as a principal is for the teacher to be providing for the students and what the teacher and or you are expecting the students to be providing during that time? Um, so that's, I think, a, an example of the, uh, the piece of developing those tools that's gonna be very important, those um, digital learning tools. Um, because 
it, it will be an excellent way to continue and talking about data right to continue to be able to really uh, track the progress of the students and where the students are, are going in the various um, subjects. But it is not our expectation um, with those 45 minutes at the end of the day that um, there's an additional, because what they are, practically speaking, remember, is a prep period for our teachers. Um, and so it's not a time in which we expect the teachers to be prepping for their prep, is what we would talk about in schools, right? So, so the we also don't want that time to be something that is not meaningful for the children. So obviously we want it to have great purpose. So the development of those tools, I think, is really going to be the key to that success. But also as we keep going, especially with our older children, you know, they'll be developing, um, uh, or the teachers will be developing work that will be ongoing with them. So, so for example, in writing, you know, you're continuing on with a piece of writing that you've started, or there's a project that you're working on, or you know, you're reading something and responding in a journal. Like we wanna be able to encourage the children to be more independent in the continuation of their work as well. And then also not relying so much on their families at home to be able to help them to do that work. So I think it's still a work in progress, but they, we're headed in the right direction with it. We really, we want to be able to get to the point that we don't have that 45 minutes at the end of the day because we have a full day, <laughs> right, of being in school. Um, but right now that's, that's uh, at least my thinking on that particular part. It happens with the Wednesdays too, honestly, because on the Wednesday we wanna be able to develop those things also, um, but we also want the children to be able to have a chance to, um, you know, have lunch right and then be able to go into a little more work before their day is over correct me if i'm wrong but in a, the normal world that period would have been when the students were either going to art music pe or something of that nature That's uh, right. and there would be no requirement for the teacher to have any preparation or follow-up or anything of, of that nature so right. I, I understand that and i'm not trying to put anybody on the spot here it just so that I, I'm trying to afford you folks an opportunity to let the parents know what is expected of the child uh, going forward during that time. Uh, thank you. And I guess it just as an aside too, we have created a challenge for ourselves in, in that because it could still be specials, right? That we're using and finding a different way to support the children in doing that. But there's a piece of the plan in which having art, music, PE, enrichment activities, um, and instrumental music starting next week too, which is great, an amazing program we have going. In those days when the children aren't present, it is, you know, it really is creating a level of planning that is tricky for us as administrators, but it is enriching those experiences when the children are home. So just a little aside. Great. Um, so I had a, just a couple of questions. So for the um, for the hybrid students on Wednesday, what is their release time? Do they get out at 11 or 1130? Or somewhere between 11 and 11. So because I guess it, it seems as though my understanding is, is that the remote academy students on Wednesdays are done with their synchronous day at 1130. Yes. We're nodding, we're shaking, we ask? Okay, and, and the hybrid students who are at home on Wednesdays are done at 11? 11? No, it should also be 11.30. So if we're okay. having some, yeah, if we, yeah. we need to continue working on the scheduling and the clarification of the scheduling, then that's certainly something that we should, and I think it is, I think it is something that we need to continue working on. That so message. all students are, uh, they start at 8.30 or do they start at 8.10? They start at 8.30. Elementary students start at 8.30 to 11.30. No, shaking. They start at 8.10 to 11.30. Everybody is Everybody. in some kind of synchronous thing. Okay. Right. And, and those, those are, I'm sorry, Ms. Morgan, it's okay. Go ahead. Um, the, uh, you know, the, the, the balance of uh, synchronous, like real time, the teachers face on the uh, screen, um, definitely a big part of that Wednesday morning. 
Um, but it may very well be, you know, just, just so parents know that like you won't, you may not see that teacher's face right up on the screen, right to the stroke of 1130. They may have charged the students with something um, that which ought to be taking them to 1130. They're almost all, I mean, what's funny is that, that many of our faculty elect to come in uh, just because they're to stay in, in, in school mode, although they're obviously not obligated to do so. And uh, when I'm there, I see them, you know, beginning to kind of filter out at 1130. I think that what I, when I'm there, what happens is that they circle back to the children uh, right at that end of the day, uh, collect things, do a closing circle, that kind of thing. But, uh, but yeah, that, that should be communicated out a little bit better than I guess. Yeah, I, I don't know. It just seems like it's it. I think that it's fine. I definitely want our teachers to have the flexibility to run that time as they would in their classroom. So I'm not looking to like dictate it. It's just I think for those of us, you know, when we're at home, um, you know, what I've heard, um, it hasn't been my experience, but what I've heard from others is that um, they just they they really need to know what that piece on Wednesday looks like, like. And, and, you know, obviously it starts for everybody at 810, it ends at 1130, give or take, right? Um, so I think that would just be, that would be helpful. Um, and, and also just in terms of talking with families about, you know, what learning time looks like. It's interesting, we've started to get more emails about that. People have, are like, they, they're, they're like now keyed into this, wait, wait, like, what's the actual learning time? Like, when, when are we doing this? And how are we meeting our, our obligation on that? So um, that's, you know, we, we have a, an extraordinarily uh, engaged and um, capable parent community in Arlington that we're very lucky to have. And I think that um, they're, you know, they're seeing a lot, they're seeing a lot of this because a lot of it's happening in their homes. Um, so I think, you know, we want to just, you know, make sure that we are able to articulate that. And I think that that's happening. Um, and I think also, you know, touching on this idea, and, and Ms. Parrott's talked about it a little bit too, this idea of, of what the expectations are at, at, on the 145 releases for the afternoon at the elementary level um, so that people can understand what, you know, what that looks like, um, I think will be helpful. I know that in our house, our second grader is told during the, the Wednesday morning, the expectation is that this afternoon you're going to do this, this, and this. Um, so, you know, I mean, at least he's been told, <laughs> um, which is great. So I think we want to just keep, you know, keep working on that. And I think that's something I assume that we're going to have some kind of back to school night remotely of some persuasion I, somehow, that. Yeah. Someday, um, which is great. And I think that would be something maybe that would be good feedback for people just to help everybody understand what the expectations are. So those are all, that's all of my questions. Anybody else? Are we good? Uh, okay. Thank you very much. And um, uh, Sam Carusis and Eva Liner are both here tonight to talk about the elementary remote um, academy program. Hi, good evening. I'm Eva Liner, one of the two administrators of the remote academy and thank you so much for having us on tonight to talk about how the start of the school year has been so sam and i have been very pleased with the start of the school year um, we're very proud of how invested the remote academy staff has been in getting to know students and delivering quality instruction even within the challenges that they face being a remote teacher with technology as our primary vehicle for interaction and instruction in the remote academy, the ups and downs with technical issues have seemed to be improving each week and our technology department is working overtime to support all of us. We've seen improvements with access to and use of the digital tools that have been provided for us by the district and students are becoming more familiar and independent with the technology. With that said, age and grade level differ, obviously, in their ability to be fully independent, as we would expect. Um, from the feedback that we've got via emails from many families, um, students are engaged, happy to go to class, and are, ready, are, are getting into the routines of being a remote student. 
So families recognize and appreciate the hard work that teachers have put into delivering remote instruction. And also teachers have reported that families have been so supportive of their efforts. And families themselves have been doing a really nice job of helping their students be a remote learner. So overall, in the three weeks since we opened the Remote Academy, things have run very smoothly. Given the fact that we essentially opened a brand new school with 875 students in 40 different classes in a remote environment. So we're actively working on smoothing out any of the inevitable kinks that have arisen in the opening of the Remote Academy. So Sam is going to speak a little more about some of the challenges that we're facing. So thank you for having us tonight. I'm Samantha Carustis, the other co-administrator. And as you can imagine, with this large school made up of people from seven other schools, we've had issues around communication and coordination. Um, you know, we have seven awesome elementary schools and the administrators and teachers work really well together. And so now we're creating this other entity that um, needs to kind of get in its own groove. And we are learning every day about things that work and don't work. And we're looking at the systems that we have put in place and trying to figure out how to make improvements on those. Um, as you can imagine, it's challenging to bring cohesion um, to the eighth elementary school when it's comprised of the others. Um, but we are learning every day. We're taking a lot of feedback from not only staff and family, um, but we're talking to our colleagues about how we can continuously improve those systems. Um, another issue that we have taken on is distributing materials to the 870 plus children. And that has been a, a challenge and we have a system in place and we did it yesterday and there was a lot of good with it and a lot of kids got what they needed to get. Um, and it may not be the most efficient system. So we have to, again, look at feedback from families and from teachers and coaches who all worked really hard to get this system in place. Um, so we will we'll tweak what we have in place and be better next time. Um, but I, I understand that everything, you know, went pretty smoothly yesterday. So I want to thank everybody that helped make that happen. Um, and then as the fully remote elementary school, you can imagine that we've had some technology challenges. Um, I will say that the children have been helping figure some of that out. They've helped their teachers, which has been wonderful. Um, but I just have to commend our IT department. They have been incredibly responsive to our needs and um, whether it's via a phone call or a text or an email, they've been right there to help us. And I know that they, you know, that's been challenging because they're trying to service everybody in the district. Um, so we are continuing to make improvements on some of the challenges that the families and the kids are having. And um, I, I feel really positive about the, just the confidence that the kids are building and that the teachers are building um, and how much support um, you know, Susan Bisson and the other IT folks and digital learning people have given um, everybody in the community. So, you know, we've started this new school and it's, it's, we're in our third week. And I would say that um, I'm incredibly proud of the teachers and their hard work and the, the rest of the staff, the children and the families. So, you know, we, we have a lot to celebrate. Thank you. Um, are there any questions for about the remote academy from anybody? Um, I, I just had one. Uh, so I see Dr. Allison Ampey. I'll ask mine first and Mr. Slickman. Um, my question was about um, if Dr. McNeil or anybody had an update on what sort of system we're going to use for elementary notifications in lieu of email. Um, do you have an update yet on that, Dr. McNeil, or is that still in progress? It's still in progress. Um, I'm having conversations with Dr. Bodie 
and our uh, Dr. I mean, uh, David Good, who is our uh, the head of our technology department for the town and for the school. And uh, so, yes, so we're it's it's a we're going to have those conversations. Super. I, I do think that it's going to help out some of our teachers too, because what happens is, is because we don't get notifications in elementary of what goes into Google Classroom, that I find that it seems that what I'm hearing is that teachers are, are posting in the Google Classroom because that's what they're told and they need to do so that kids can click the links, but then they're also having to duplicate that effort by emailing all of us because we don't see it. Um, so anyway, the sooner we can get some resolution or some progress and momentum on that. Um, I'm, I'm certainly looking forward to it. So, uh, Absolutely. yeah, Mr. Schlickman. Uh, thank you very much. I mean, there, there have been two questions regarding remote learning uh, that the people have had. And, and I'd like uh, the folks to sort of uh, talk about this a little. Uh, one was addressing the uh, quality of instruction that would occur under remote learning, given that uh, uh, we were experiencing difficulty getting up and running at the onset of the epidemic. And second is how are we providing for social emotional learning within the context of the remote learning uh, environment? Well, I, I can talk a little bit about that. Um, just to, uh, as we looked and planned for the opening of school, our uh, coaches and our curriculum leaders integrated SEL activities within their lessons in order to start the school. So everybody came up with like a 10 day plan um, before like, and still doing things that are related to the content, but a lot of the activities are geared towards building that social you know focusing on the social emotional well-being of students and and creating a classroom culture um so you know a lot of that has been taking place uh, we're at the point now we're going to start you know diving into the like i said before we're still doing you know content uh, but you know having the sel integrated in that and then you know now we're you know getting into the units uh in the various content areas so we have integrated those activities in order to create a classroom culture still connected to the content but you know you know leaning towards those you know social emotional um competencies that we want students to have moving forward like creating relationships and i was able to actually look at some of the feedback that um eva and sam uh, were able to garner from their the teachers in a remote by choice academy and what i think is happening even though that students in certain classrooms maybe from different buildings they're actually finding you know it very uh, beneficial that they're meeting new people uh, from other schools so you know the relationships that are being cultivated now they will revisit later on when they all come together in the uh, at gibbs and onward right so they get the gibbs and then until they graduate, they'll all be together because that's the way the structure of our middle school works and definitely our high school. So I think that, you know, I think we've done a very good job of creating those classroom cultures, addressing our SEL, um, the, the social emotional well being of students, and it's not going to stop. We're still, you know, integrating those type of things into our content area lessons as well. So there's a lot of integration going on there. I don't know one, if the, the principals want to add anything or one um, thing that I would like to add just about um, addressing the quality of instruction. I think that the teachers have learned a lot from uh, last spring, their experiences, and they've had time over the summer to learn about the tools that they are using this year to deliver instruction. And now they have colleagues to work with and we're meeting with them in grade level teams so that they have an opportunity to talk and learn from one another and really share resources. So they are sharing best practices with one another and developing some really dynamic lessons that they are 
uh, delivering in their Google Classrooms and on, uh, on Zoom lessons. So I think it's, it's a very rich learning environment. Oh, let me just say that I've heard uh, from a couple of parents who are in the remote uh, academy and they've been thrilled with the uh, instruction and the connections that they've been making within that context. So uh, uh, job well done, it seems. Thank you. Dr. Allison Ampey. Thank you. Um, just to speak to Mr. Uh, to Dr. McNeil's point, um, my daughter was at Thompson, I'm uh, at Stratton when Thompson came and stayed there while Thompson was being rebuilt. And yes, those, you know, she made a lot of friends and they all had fun when they went to middle school together later. Um, so my question was, I'm wondering how things are going for special education students who are in the remote academy. Um, and is there anything that can be done to improve it, uh, to improve their experience? So um, the, I, I think that the SPED services have gotten off the ground and um, the liaisons have developed their schedules. We are now, I think, finally fully staffed with teaching assistants for the special education program. Um, so students should be receiving their services. And um, I think that everything is in place now. So it should be going pretty smoothly. Yeah, and I think I would just add that, um, you know, the remote setting, the remote classroom is different than our building-based classrooms. And so delivery of services, particularly inclusion services and things look, look differently. And I think what's, what's working is that people are adjusting, right? We're, we're learning about the setting and what's going to work best for individual kids. And we're making adjustments based on again, what Sam had said earlier, best practice. So I think that um, I, I've been, as Sam said, we're getting off the ground. And um, what I've been very proud of with the staff is the flexibility to adjust and to be able to sort of take the feedback from kids and families and adjust and um, provide the services in a way that makes sense given our remote environment. Thank you. Great. Anybody else on that one? Mr. Thielman. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thanks very much for the presentation. Could you just, um, to give context here, give some numbers? How many students are in the remote academy at the, element, at the elementary level and how many teachers are teaching in it? Yep. Um, we have 40 classroom teachers yep. and um, we have, it's the number I believe is 875, but we have students who are shifting from the hybrid model to the remote. So that number is growing a little bit um, as we, uh, you know, have more students join our program. Um, so we have 14 classroom teachers. We have three special ed liaisons who each, um, who have T five TAs that are working with them currently. As, as Sam said, we've, we've truly just, been hiring people in the last couple of weeks to round out that program. Um, we're still in the process. I know you're talking about hiring a little bit later, but we're, um, we also have kindergarten TAs. We, we need to hire a couple more of those. Um, but that is, and then we have two reading specialists as well that are strictly devoted to the remote academy. And um, the total elementary school population, Dr. Bodie, what it's, I don't have it off the top of my head. Uh, I can't. Yeah, uh, it's a little over 3,000. Yeah, so it's about, okay. And then, so so I have, you know, just anecdotally, I have uh, spoken to uh, many elementary school parents um, uh, who have expressed a great deal of satisfaction uh, with the Remote Academy. So congratulations to, to both of you uh, for your work and the, and the 40 teachers and the, uh, all the TAs, and, and obviously they're the ones doing the work along with all of you. My question to you, and I've actually talked to um, at least one parent, uh, that I, one, one family that I know that is going from uh, hybrid to remote. And I'm wondering if, if you could sort of speak to what you're hearing anecdotally from the families that want to switch. Um, I think 
circumstances in homes vary. Yep. Um, and so um, I think some families have wanted to try out the hybrid to see how it worked and just weren't necessarily comfortable perhaps with the level of interaction. Um, other families, you know, um, health, health situations in the home changed. And so they're, they're not able to send their child into school anymore. So it's really a mixed bag, yep. I think. Yep. Okay. I, yeah. I just want to not be saw any trend. Okay. The only thing that I would add to that is that the remote learning environment is really challenging for some children. Mm -hmm. And so I, I have talked to some parents who um, it just, it, it is not tenable. So they have asked to move their child back to the hybrid model, yeah. just to even have some in-person experience. Yeah, there's both, there's, there's switches going. I know there's switches going on both sides. Yeah. Um, so to that point, what is our, uh, I should know this and I'm sorry I don't uh, know off the top of my head. What is our policy on, on people wanting to switch from hybrid to remote, remote to hybrid? Do we have any, we don't have deadlines, do we? Are we flexible on that or are we, what's the, how's that work? Well, we are both flexible and have deadlines. We have a form that parents uh, okay. need to complete. Yep. And uh, we can perhaps have a two week at minimum turnaround, possibly, it can go faster. But the important thing is on a space availability basis. Yeah. And we do have, um, this is something we looked at with the remote academy. We do have some classes that could have other students, but I will say this, that it's probably, parents should not think that they would be able to be placed in a class with, with, within their home school though we only have about half of that 40 that's entirely uh, entirely school-based. And the same, and, and when you wanna go from remote to hybrid, it, it's on space availability basis as well, because it's only so many students we can have in the classroom. Yeah, thanks for clarifying that because people have asked that question. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I mean, I would just, I, I think, you know, my, observation of this is that it's just what um, Ms. Liner said is that it is it's situational every household every household in Arlington every household probably across the country is a little bit different the dynamic is a little bit different for some families remote works great just because of the, the setup the support um, all sorts of different and you know obviously people have health uh, concerns that are real uh, important um, to consider but um, so I, I, I think the answer that I'm finding in thinking about this is that every every family situation is different and people are trying to figure out the, what to do what's best for their family. So thank you for your work and for this information. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, so Dr. Bodhi, what I'd like to do just because um, of, of timing and because of um, Ms. Thomas's schedule. So we've done a bunch of our, we've done our um, done our elementary, um, we've done our elementary, we've done our, we did Gibbs, we did elementary, we did remote academy, we still um, have the Audison, and then is Ms. Tavon going to speak to the high school? Is that the plan? Yes, okay. Um, but I'd, I'd, I'd like to just move um, the opening update for METCO up now so that Ms. Thomas can provide us with her information um, because of her schedule. So, um, and then come back to um, the Audison and the high school. So, thank Hello. you. Thank you. Thank you for moving me up and um, I appreciate that. And thank you for letting me be here today to present. I did do a PowerPoint, which would probably go a little bit quicker. Um, so I don't know if I can share my screen. Um, I think you should be able to down at the bottom. Okay. Oh, yep, should, all panelists. Okay. Thank you. Again, thank you for having me here today that I could present. I'll just present quickly about what happened during the spring closure and then I would go into um, what we have done to help with reopening. <clears throat> so for the 2019-2020, there were 74 students that participated in the programs, and those were grades K through 12. 
um, those students attend Hardy, Pierce, Bishop, Gibbs, Audison in the high school. Um, I just wanted to let you know what the staff look, uh, makeup is for the MECO team, which is myself. We have a social worker, Tanika Claiborne, that works with the elementary and middle school students. We have a social work intern, Rochelle Smith, that is working with the middle and high school students with me. And then we have bus monitors. We have two of them, Donna Cloakley and Kit Katana Cruz. Um, so when we closed on um, March 12th, the 13th really, um, we immediately reached out to families through telephone calls and emails to determine the most important resources family needed. Um, at that time, also families were able to uh, receive Chromebooks when Arlington had their distribution dates. Um, for families that were not able to come out to Arlington, the team met families in Boston to provide them um, with the Chromebook they needed. Um, we also gave families information in regards to um, food that Boston Public Schools had 97 locations open to provide breakfast and lunch between the hours of 8.30 and 11.30. And the reason why our families here in Boston could participate in that because they were Boston residents. So that was also open to them and they did not have to be a Boston Public School student. Um, then we had our social workers and myself we did a uh, student virtual social um, community lunch groups. We also contracted with Anne's Christian Learning Center to provide supplemental tutorial support for 40 students who had been receiving intervention services before the closure. We also engaged um, Mindy Wright consultants to provide college access workshops for juniors and seniors to help them to continue with that work. And then we continue to outreach to families to check in on the virtual learning and to provide any referrals for other supports if they needed it. For the reopening, um, I do sit on the core steering committee. Um, um, one of my charges was transportation. Um, I worked really uh, closely with Michael Mason who oversees our transportation contract. Um, we followed the Department of Elementary and Secondary Eight um, guidelines for transportation. So we're providing transportation for 30 students who have chosen the hybrid model. We have um, 17 riders on the elementary bus that includes the bus monitor and the bus driver. And we also have 17 on the secondary bus, which is the Gibbs, Audison, and high school. We have four students um, that come four days a week. They are actually at um, Hardy, the Audison, and the high school. And then we also have um, room on the bus for students at the high school for um, participating in the reverse field trip. Um, I've done three uh, material distributions in Boston over the last three weeks for families who were unable to come to get supplies um, during the uh, so, uh, supply opening, which was 11.30 to one on Wednesdays. It was just the alternative time and date. Um, during that time, they were able to get their MBTA passes, Chromebook, iPads, or textbooks and art supplies. <clears throat> the other thing that we're doing is for students that are in a remote academy, they would um, immediately um, be provided with uh, tutorial supports from Ann's Christian Learning Center. And then we're continuing now to uh, put together a schedule to provide uh, support for the students um, in hybrid and remote. And I'm also working with Food Services, um, Denise, to come up with a weekly schedule for those students that are in remote who still need lunch. Looking ahead, um, when the uh, high school opens up in February as a hybrid model, we will have to contract for a third bus. Um, Michael Mason is in conversations with the transportation company in regards about that. Um, if Arlington goes to full remote, 
and Christian Learning Center will again do supplemental tutorial support for all students. And then the last thing I just wanted to share is that we actually have three seniors right now. They're a semi-finalist for a Posse Scholarship Foundation, which is a four-year um, scholarship that they can receive if they win. Um, to, there's about four different uh, colleges that they can attend. And that is what I have. Great, thank you so much, Ms. Thomas. Um, so questions from the committee for Ms. Thomas. I see Mr. Hainer, Mr. Cardin, Mr. Schlickman, Dr. Alison Hampy, okie dokie. Uh, Mr. Cardin. Uh, thank you, thank you for um, presenting and for all the hard work you've done in reaching out to individ these individual families. Just on the, on the numbers, there were 74 students during the last 1920 year. How many do we have combined with the remote and the hybrid? It looks like 30 in the hybrid. So how many are doing remote only? Did we lose people or? No, we didn't. We, I only lost one student this year. So we're back to 74 students. Um, one student that we did lose um, actually moved to Foxborough. So that was the only reason that we moved, um, that we lost students. Um, other than that, um, my numbers have been solid. Um, it, it's kind of a, a split. So as you can see, um, for hybrid, we have 30. And then, I'm sorry, for, um, for remote, I didn't do those numbers. So it's kind of a split, half and half. Great. Well, it's great we didn't lose anyone. That was one of my fears. So thank you for, for that. And uh, that's it. Thanks. You're welcome. Dr. Allison Ampey. Thank you very much. It's great to have this update, and I think maybe we should do it every year, even when we're not in weird circumstances. Um, I, and it's really nice to know how you've maintained the connections and, and taken care of all the things that I've been worried about, and just to hear that we're really um, doing things for our families. Um, I have one question just based on the name. I just wanted to understand. So Anne's Christian Learning Center is secular. Okay. It's secular. It's not, it's, it's that's just the name. So okay. it's, not, it, yes. Right, and I'm not trying to say there's anything wrong with it, just given the name and yeah. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Mr. Heener. I just want to thank you uh, for all the work that you've done. Uh, during this time, it's been hectic, and I just cannot imagine the hours and time that you've had to put in. So thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Schuchman? Yeah, I, I was going to ask uh, the same question to Dr. Allison Ampey, is that given the name of the organization, is this a secular organization, and are they credentialed? Um, I want to thank uh, Ms. Thomas for her efforts on behalf of the students, and I hope she communicates to the uh, families how much we care about them and we want them to have a wonderful experience with us, uh, both through the pandemic and uh, going forward. Is there anything else we can do as a committee to uh, facilitate that and to make further connections with our Medco families? Uh, uh, that, uh, it's it's the top of the list of this committee, and I hope that uh, uh, we can do more. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Anybody else? Great, Mr. Thielman. Thank you. Thanks very much for the presentation. Um, we don't we don't get many presentations from Meco, so this I I do think this should be an annual thing. Thanks. I my question was how many were in hybrid, and how many were remote. So it's 30 in hybrid, 44 in remote. Um, do you have any do you have any sense of of um that that's so compared to the rest of the district that split is different um you know the rest of the district is something like two-thirds remote uh i'm sorry two-thirds hybrid a third remote something like that uh generally breaks down that way what what's your sense um about why it broke broke in that direction um so what the, what i actually did and i know we sent out the survey to families i also called each one of my families just to see if they, which one they were choosing, whether it would be hybrid or remote. And it gave me the opportunity to hear their reasonings. Um, and so some of my families chose remote because 
I have um, some families that have multiple children in different buildings. They have a pre-existing condition. They didn't want to not send one and then send the others and then the others come back home. It was just becoming a higher risk. Um, I had families that um, families are working from home, so it's easier for them to just be home and be remote with their, with their children. Um, I had families that they chose in hybrid because they felt like that would be better for their child. They've been home <laughs> for almost eight, six months and they were like, they need to get out. So it was just a myriad of reasons um, that families either chose hybrid or remote. Um, some families, for them, it was just still the safety issue. They still were not ready um, to send their child hybrid. Um, and some families, they just wanted to try. I think we did have one family that, uh, and um, at the Hardy that would wa had wanted to go hybrid, but then changed their mind again and wanted to stay remote. So, and I haven't had many, I don't think we have many requests of anybody wanting to change back and forth. Got it. Do, do you have a, uh, this, you know, you, you may not have this data and so you can just, you know, forget my question if it's, a, if it's not, if it's not, but it's not, Helpful, but do you have a sense of how we compare in terms of uh, participation in remote versus hybrid compared to other other Medco districts? Do you ever do you have that data? I don't have the data, but I do talk to my um, I do talk to my peers a lot. Um, so I, I, one of the things you all don't know maybe is I am the vice president of the Medco Directors Association. So we have an executive board that meets, and then I meet monthly with my peers. So it's it's really um, it's just like Lexington. Um, my peer over there thought that she was going to get more numbers that wanted to go remote. Remote. She got more numbers that wanted to go hybrid. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it just depends on the district. I think it depends on the model that they have chosen, um, that the numbers are going to fluctuate. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I, okay. Thank you. It's, it's, I, I mean, I, I can, I can get the information from you for you. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, that's easy enough for me to do. I'm just giving you some of that anecdotal information of just talking to people, but that's not something that we've all put together as directors. But, and I think it's easy enough for me to ask my peers. It would be, if you, I don't want to give you more work and I'm only one member of this committee, but if you can get that information to the to Superintendent Bodie, then she can share it with us. That would be great. Okay. That would be, yeah, that would be great. Um, <clears throat> okay. Uh, well, Thanks very much for your work. Good to see you here. And uh, we should have, you know, I agree with Dr. With Dr. Sh I was going to say Dr. Schlickman, Paul, Mr. Schlickman, to have, uh, we should be having more contact in, uh, with you and your, and your team to keep this dialogue going. So thanks so much. Thank this you. Is, yep. Thank, Thank you. And I'm sorry that I have to leave. I'm, I just need to check on Thanks. my family. I think the fact that you stayed at a school committee meeting for an hour and a half, you should get an award for, you should get a raise. It's like a, Good thing. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, Dr. Bodie, we um, still have uh, the Addison in the high school. Yes, is that where you're going next? That's where I'm going next. And Mr. Maringer, I believe, is still here. I am. You are. I'll go next. So um, I think the uh, opening at the Audison went very well. Um, I was very pleased with how we opened. Kids seem to uh, enjoy being back at school and I've gotten a lot of positive reports from the remote academy. So one piece of data, which I think has shown that it's been fairly successful is um, there are 900 students at the Audison, a little less. There's about 600 that are in the hybrid program and about 300 that are in the remote academy. And so far, I've not received one request to move from either the remote academy to hybrid or from hybrid uh, to the remote academy. And I know I'm only about three weeks in, but I'm taking that as a very positive sign that parents are happy with what they've chosen. And I think with the remote academy, I've received some unsolicited emails that have really praised some of the teachers. And I think that's a, a result of the teachers who want it to be all remote have just really done a good job. They were motivated to really put their best foot forward and they have. So I'm extremely happy about that. 
Um, I will say, and I, I thank a lot of the students, they've done a great job of keeping their masks on. That hasn't been an issue that I know we were concerned with, especially with middle school kids. Um, there are times we are reminding them to stay socially distanced. And, um, you know, not everything is perfect, but I think it's gone really well. I think the staff has been outstanding in terms of rallying around each other, figuring out solutions to problems. So I think they are to be commended. And I'd really like to thank some of the families. So I've had families call up when their kids are sick and say that they don't think that it's something serious, but they would get their um, students tested before heading back. And I think that I really appreciate a lot of the families pitching in and um, really doing their part to keep everyone safe because we'd like to keep the hybrid going as long as possible. And uh, we're really looking forward to um, you know, the next few weeks, next few months, hopefully getting kids educated in school. We also have uh, been a little bit lucky with the weather. We've been having the kids outside for mass breaks and also for lunch and in the morning, I think has gone really well. Unfortunately, it looks like next week, the string of rain only on Wednesday, which is what we hope for all the time, uh, might be ending. So we might be having to uh, have lunches and some lineups in school, but we've got the space between the wood gym, the blue gym, the cafeteria. So um, overall, uh, I think it's been a good start. I am, I am a little concerned that we can keep up this energy level. We're just kind of at the beginning of this marathon and uh, teachers are working real hard. I am, I think um, Dr. Hannah might have said it or um, Kate might have said that they're a little bit worried about keeping the remote academy teachers still feeling like they're part of the school system. Um, but so far, I think the uh, opening has gone really well. Great, thank you, Mr. Maringer. Um, questions from the committee or comments? No? Uh, Mr. Cardin. Sure, just a quick one. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Maringer, for all your efforts. Um, certainly, I've heard from parents that the there may have been some concerns <laughs> earlier in September about how things were, were going there, but um, the commu communications have been frequent and clear and things seem to, fall, seem to have fallen into place. So people are, are appreciative of that. My question was with, again, with the, the remote days and the hybrid program, um, uh, how, to what extent is, is your team or the, the um, curriculum directors providing support for the teachers to create the activities for those days, or is that still falling on the teachers? Um, and, and is there enough work being created for the students on those days, or, or are we still um, getting up to speed as far as filling those days for the, the hybrid program students when they're remote? Yeah, so there are some classes that um, students will have to be in during the hybrid. So for example, if you have world language, if you have math support, you have reading, um, you do have slotted times in which you have to show up for a 45 minute class. I would say most of the students would have two classes on an asynchronous day. You also have PE, you might have band, orchestra, or chorus. So um, there are times that students have to check in and they have been checking in and attendance has been very positive. Um, so far, the Wednesday has really been the time in which the um, teachers have been planning during the afternoon to give asynchronous lessons. For example, I know I talked to the civics teachers the other day and they're kind of in lockstep. And I think what has happened is you really have the teachers planning and giving a lot of the same asynchronous lessons out together. Um, so far, um, what I've heard is things are going really well. Um, usually I do get emails to, uh, keep me abreast of the situation when parents feel like their kids aren't doing enough work or when they're feeling overloaded. So uh, we're still waiting to hear a little bit from that. What I, what I gleam right now is we've done pretty well, but 
you know, it's also the first three weeks. I know the first week or two was a little bit lighter. I think the third week has been a little bit more, um, you know, commitment and effort needed by the students. And I, you know, as I said, one of the concerns I have is keeping this energy level up. So I think I'll be better able to answer your questions probably in a couple of weeks. Great. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Great. Mr. Thielman. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> um, so my question, Mr. Maringer, is one of the things that I, uh, that I think several people have concerns about is just the degree to which, um, you know, in, in mathematics, in, in, the, in our math sequence, students are going to cover enough material so they're ready for high school math in particular. And I'm wondering, you know, it's early, it's three weeks in, it's too early to tell you know, what percentage of the curriculum will be covered uh, in, say, seventh grade math or eighth grade algebra for those who are taking it. But are you, are you, ha are, are you starting to have some conversations about that? Are you monitoring that? Are you thinking about that as a team? I'm just kind of curious about where that is going. So um, I have talked to Matt Coleman, who's the curriculum director for math. And I think one of the strengths about having K through 12 coordinators is they really know the scope and sequence of what they're teaching. And so I know that Matt has had conversations with the teachers of what units they need to stress and what, what, what units they might have to omit. And so, you know, I, I, I am leaving it in his capable hands because he knows what the curriculum is for ninth, 10th, 11th, and, and 12th grade. And he has really made sure that he has sat with his math teachers over the summer, but also having regular correspondence and really stressing what is the most important um, concepts and theories that the kids need to know. Okay. All right. Thanks. I, I um, well, but thank you to, to, to you and your team for your efforts. Um, you know, there's lots of studies about what happened to uh, uh, young people in uh, World War II when they couldn't go to school for a while, what happened to the students after Katrina. Um, and so I hope our, you know, I'm, I'm just grateful that people are trying and working really hard to try to educate our kids in a difficult time. So thank you to you and your team. Yeah, and, and the curriculum directors have been outstanding. And it is one of the advantages. There's many school systems that have, you know, have um, department chairs at the high school and then department chairs at the middle school. And that has some advantages too, because it's a little bit more building based. But one of the things that I think is a benefit right now is that you have, you know, whether it's you know, Denny Conklin or Deb Perry, they know what they need to prepare the kids for ahead of time in a K through 12 span. And so they're able to make decisions and nobody wants to cut out um, activities. And I, I think it's disingenuous to say that, you know, kids are going to learn the same amount of content that they would this year as in previous years. But I do think that you have to pick and choose, and I think they'll know what to um, select because they know what is upcoming. All right. I just want to—I just want to confirm Mr. Maringer's assessment of what will be addressed. Um, the same units in math will be taught as previous years, but there's going to be some modification as to which standards will be stressed, and we're shooting—you know we are trying to focus on and making sure that we're covering the essential standards that students will need for the next level. So, um, you know, we're going to make sure that that does take place. So we're, we're like, we have identified essential standards in each content area and we're focusing on those. And so um, it will be the same units. It just will be some modifications as to which standards will be stressed and which ones will be you know, still taught, but not stressed as much as these essential standards. And the other thing I think we're interested in is classes are small. You know, um, you know, I wish we could fit more students in. I know that some students and some families would like to be there four days a week, but sometimes, you know, in that particular class, there's only 12 desks and chairs and we don't have any more space. But the smaller classes to me will be interested to see what the learning is there as well. Because when there's 
11 kids, it's a lot different than when you're having classes, obviously, of twice that size. So um, you are getting a little bit more individualized attention um, as, as you only have half the students who are in class than, in, than usual. Thanks very much. Great, anybody else? Um, so just, you know, I, I've been really impressed with how the schedule has sort of shaken out at the Audison. I feel like there's a nice balance um, on the home days of having opportunities for, you know, robust classes that are meeting. Um, I've been amazed at what teachers, what I've heard and experienced teachers are doing, um, able to meet with kids one-on-one, -on -one, which I actually never thought we would be doing, which is funny, which of course they can meet with kids one-on-one. -on -one. <laughs> That's actually super safe, but um, I, it, it has been really impressive. And I do think that the days, the in-person days are extremely, um, robust and rich because they have to be because I know that our teachers are trying to get a lot in during that time so that our students are well prepared to spend their time learning um, on their own during the other days. So um, I, I've just been really impressed with the communication, everything from Mr. Miringer through his assistant principals, through the teachers, through classroom teachers and specialist teachers. Um, it just has been really clear communication, really easy to follow. Um, so it, it feels, you know, it feels really successful from the, the student perspective, certainly. So that's, that's my feedback. Well, great. Thank you. We always, we always enjoy the positive feedback and I'm glad things are going well. And, you know, um, you did mention the two assistant principals. So Julie McEwen and Rochelle Rubino have really been communicating, I think, you know, very often in trying to make things hopefully as, as clear and concise to um, people at home, because I know a lot of families are struggling with the amount of emails and keeping their kids organized. So I, I'm hoping that's helping. Great. We also have Maureen Murphy this year, who is overseeing the remote academy program, both Audison and Gibbs. So that's another great resource. Yes, I don't want to leave Maureen out and she's taken a lot off our plate in terms of being able to um, not only at the at the Audison but also at the Gibbs answering a lot of questions for uh, parents who are in fully remote. You want to do the high school Dr. Bodie? I would. I'm a Sibnet. Ronnie Sibnet. Yep, I'm here. You're here. Oh, there you are. Thank you for coming. Thank you for waiting as long uh, for the high school. Um, so let me just turn it over to you. Sure. Thank you, Dr. Bodie, and thank you for having me. Um, for those of you I don't know, I'm Ronnie Tibnan. I'm one of the deans at Arlington High. Um, Dr. Janger had a conflict tonight, so I'm happy to represent our administrative team and, and let you know a little bit about what's going on at the high school. Um, along with what so many people have said, I'm happy to report that things have gone very smooth at the start of the school year. So much of it is a result of the dedication and the flexibility of our teachers. Um, I can echo what, what Brian just said about our curriculum leaders, the work that they have done to completely adjust curriculum to be able to fit our, our mostly remote model with our small group of, of population of students that are coming to the building each day. Um, so I'll start with some of our classes and our schedule and what's working well. As far as the academics, the feedback that we received from parents and students and teachers is the change to our semester-based schedule, which we were nervous about, it has its ups and downs, but it's really, we've gotten a lot of positive feedback that it's working so much better for our students and our teachers than the model we were working with in the spring when we were kind of jumping into this blind. So we're able to adjust to that. Students are taking on average three classes um, per semester and it's really reducing the stress and the workload of juggling everything for teachers and students. And the attendance remains very high. We monitor it every single day, and I think that's a really good piece of data that shows us that our students are staying engaged. And, and similar to what Brian said, we're still in the, the beginning of this marathon, but so far so good. We're really seeing a high rate of attendance and participation on behalf of the students. And we are so appreciative that we just received some additional technology for our teachers to have new tools 
such as things like an extra monitor so they can monitor the students and their work and their lesson at the same time while they're teaching either from home or remotely from their classroom. Um, teachers report that you know, the semester schedule and the remote learning is definitely a, a huge increase in amount of time needed to plan and to change their, their lessons and their curriculum. Um, but they're doing it, they're being incredibly flexible and collaborating and it's just been really fun to see how they're using all these new technology tools and making their lessons still rigorous and, and fun, although remote. Um, for in-person opportunities, I think that's something we were all really concerned about when we made this decision to go mostly remote at the high school. How can we still work with the social emotional piece of our students and the in-person connections that we know they all need. So we have had a lot of, of great opportunities for in-person meeting and instruction. We've had four or five very successful reverse field trips, as we're calling it, where teachers are offering small groups of students to come either to the high school. Today, they, there was a walking tour through Arlington Center to do a history lesson. Um, several opportunities have already happened and have been a huge success. And we have at least five more planned for tomorrow and for next week. So teachers are really, really working hard to create those opportunities to get to see their students face to face and meet them. We've had two of our in-person ninth grade orientation sessions took place yesterday, and we have two more planned for next week. So that's predominantly for ninth grade, but it's through the advisory classes. So we also have the upperclassmen who serve as peer mentors that get to come and, and participate in that as well. So it is a chance for other students, upperclassmen to come and meet some of the ninth graders. And that went wonderfully yesterday. And so we're looking forward to the next two next Wednesday. Uh, we had several teachers who wanted to meet their students. That was a big concern on the behalf of the teachers saying if we're starting the year remote it's so hard to start when you have never even seen the student or met the student last year when we went into remote it was nice that the connections and the relationships were already there so it's tough to start without that so a lot of teachers actually offered opportunities for students to come and pick up whether it was art supplies um, or textbooks or handouts and, and get to meet their students face to face before they really got rolling with the school year I'm thinking about what Sam had mentioned as far as textbook distribution on a larger scale to all of these remote students. We've been working on that for the past week. We did have a system of massive textbook distribution for all students. Um, I need to publicly thank Stacy Kitsis, our media center specialist who organized an amazing way of printing out book slips for each one of these students and merging power school um, with their schedules and being able to organize and safely hand out textbooks for hundreds and hundreds of students. So we're still hoping to continue that similar process on Wednesdays, every Wednesday for media center materials or any other materials that teachers want to get out to their students as the year goes on. Um, so similar to what Sam said with the remote academy, we have to tweak our system a little bit. We, we learned from the first few days of textbook distribution and we will continue to improve it and make it better. Um, we did have opportunities for orchestra and band to come together and practice on Pierce Field, which was great to see. They came in early in the morning, pulling into work and seeing the students out there practicing and rehearsing um, social distance and safely was wonderful. And Mr. Bowler, the athletic director, reports that athletics is up and running for the teams that are meeting and are competing. Last weekend was our first round of um, competitions of track meets and games and, and all went great, went smoothly with that as well. Um, outreach to families was another one of our concerns starting the, the world remotely and there is a huge team of school counselors, social workers, administrators, and secretarial support staff who every day are reaching out to families, whether it be Zoom meetings, phone calls, emails, um, and several face-to-face -face meetings with social workers and, and counselors too. We're still having our, our weekly team meetings where we discuss at-risk students and put together a plan of supports, um, so that is in, in full effect. We are working on documenting all of our efforts as far as outreach to families. And I know Dr. Janger is preparing a, a very more detailed report to present to school committee in the upcoming weeks. Um, so I'll end with just a few concerns that we still have, similar to what every, everyone else has reported as far as technology issues. Um, we all know the strange things that happen on Zoom and some of our students have found creative ways to join different Zoom meetings and join different classrooms and, and have a little disruption there. So we're working with our tech department to make sure we limit all of that and we, um, we learn <laughs> all of these new technology ins and outs. We still have our issues with, with the building as you're well aware of and the ventilation systems. There are some ups and downs with that and not all classrooms being available. Um, I think the, the biggest concern that I have with high school being remote is just that small population of student that we are inviting into the building and we want them to come into the building. We know that they have special needs and some of them have opted not to. And I think a lot of them report that it's just 
a different atmosphere than what they're used to. They wanted to come to the building at first, but now where there's not many other kids there and there's not that social piece and their friends aren't there, that some of them who we would like to bring in have chosen not to. And, and I worry about keeping them engaged in, in what we're doing. I've already had a handful of students thinking about taking the GED or the high set um, that I, I feel as though we need to work harder to reach out and engage them and pull them in. So we are working on that, um, that as well. And just continuing to make improvements on everything. As everybody else said, we're kind of learning as we go. But overall, I think that the remote um, learning has been going much better um, than we anticipated. And students are really staying engaged and, and wanting to come and join in all of our activities that are in person to see their teachers and, and see their peers. Great. Thank you so much. Um, questions for uh, Ms. Tivnin. Uh, Ms. Exton, did you have anything? No. Uh, Mr. Carden? Um, sure. So uh, I know you're just beginning to ramp up the reverse field trips. When you say five, four or five that have been held, I assume we're, do we're not doing full class, full 20 mm -hmm. students at a time. So are we talking about four classes having, you know, two or three reverse field trips so that people come in in shifts? Or are we talking, are we counting, you know, four sets of 10 students, so 40 students total? No, the, the first scenario. So we've had four or five teachers divide their classes into sections of 10 and try to work through them each in a day. Great. Thanks. Um, I mean, I, you know, I know we, um, I know you're just ramping up, but and we we have uh, more information coming from Dr. Jenger on the on the plan for in-person opportunities. But I, again, I would just encourage us to do as much as possible to, you know, while the weather's still good, mm -hmm. to get people meeting in person um, mm -hmm. over over the next six weeks. Thank you. Yes, I think we we definitely the numbers are high in the next couple of weeks of teachers who are reserving spots, reserving spaces, and reserving time slots. I think everyone's getting a little nervous about the weather and about the condition of some of the classrooms in the building that we may not have as much space as we'd like to have to do some inside in person reverse field trips in the winter. Great, thank you. Dr. Allison Ampey. I just wanted to um share that I've heard from some families who talk about how the sports practices, um, to even just practice, doesn't have to be the meets or anything, are really something that's tying their students back to the school and making a big difference in terms of how they feel. And, you know, in they feel much better having the sports practice. So I hope we can continue doing everything we can to make things happen and um, if there's any way we might be able to expand it safely, um, I think we should look at that. I, I agree 100%. I have started volunteering on the cross country team to help them out since they had such huge high numbers. Um, for just the girls cross country, they have almost 100 students that are, are running this year and so we're constantly reminding them to wear the masks and the public runs, wear the masks when you're around the res or any bike path so that we can continue, be safe, be smart and make sure we're good role models out there so that you know, we'll be able to continue with the increasing some of the sports. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Thelman. Yeah, thanks very much uh, for the presentation. And um, I wanna echo what Dr. Allison Ampey said about sports. There are a number of families that uh, we know and their, their students are in, are in some sports activity and it makes a world of difference because they're connected to other kids. Uh, they're outdoors, they're having fun, um, and it, it keeps them engaged. So, um, you know, I want to echo, I was going to say what Mr. Carden said, which is that, I, I, you know, we, we have a report due from uh, the, uh, Dr. Janger in a 10 days or a week or two weeks, I guess two weeks, uh, or I guess it's due to us on the 16th, but we're going to talk about it at the following meeting. And so one of the things we, we asked for was, was data on the number of students who um, have some contact in person with an adult, whether it's through, and so it'd be, it's gonna be interesting to see how many are through sports, which is wonderful, of course, how many are uh, having contact through reverse field trips and how many kids that we actually in total get to 
see an adult, whether it's at AHS or in a field trip in town or <clears throat> on the field or whatever. And I, I do want to encourage the school leadership, um, and, and I think everyone's doing a good job. I want to, I want to encourage the school leadership to try to get as many kids as possible to connect with an adult uh, mm -hmm. this month. October is a good month for it. It gets colder, mm -hmm. it gets more challenging. So. Yep, we agree 100%. We're on board. The other question I have is <clears throat> one of the things that we were um, asking about at the a few meetings ago as we were preparing for this um, remote experience for our students at the high school is um, <clears throat> follow up phone calls for students who uh, miss assignments, miss work, don't um, uh, attend class. Um, I'm just wondering if, if you have any information, whether it's data or anecdotal on how that's working. Mm -hmm. Yes, we spend a huge, huge amount of time doing that each day. So as far as just attendance, missing class, um, the deans and a couple of our administrative assistants are making a lot of those phone calls in live time. Where one of the challenges for teachers, we're asking teachers to try to do attendance in the first 15 minutes, the classes are 80 minutes long, we would have plenty of time to still reach out to a student and a parent and say, hey, what's going on? You're not on your English class. Is there a technical issue or how can we get you on as soon as possible so you don't miss a full 80 minutes? Because um, that's a big chunk of time. Good. Um, Good. So we are doing that every day. And teach, and we're documenting all of that as far part of Dr. Janger's reports of how many emails and how many phone calls are going out. And teachers are doing a great job of reaching out and including the deans in any emails so that we know which one of our students are are struggling uh, and not not engaging. Yeah, uh, I would just say from you know personal experience as a parent, and then you know experience in the circle of people we know is that the you know the the remote experience is is far superior to what uh, what students and families experienced last year so mm -hmm. last spring so uh, congratulations to everyone Thank that you. worked hard to make that happen that's good to hear thanks thank you mr schlickman hi thank you very much uh you're probably uh the wrong person to ask ms tivnan but uh uh do we have a count of how many of these uh Zoom frolics we have of people popping up into classes where the, where, where they don't be uh, belong. Is this a uh, very infrequent but annoying, or is this a little more frequent than than, than, than we expected? It's a infrequent but annoying. Uh, it, we had two or three of the kind of anonymous Zoom bombing that I think a lot of us have experienced from people that we believe may have been outside of the high school and um, unique things like that. That was maybe two or three of them that were reported to us. And just recently, we've had two this week of students, we believe to be students changing names and jumping on. So we will put an end to it quickly, but just one of the, the new challenges of remote learning that we figure out as we go. And, and the technology department has already been on helping us identify who's, who's signing in and what's going on. Yeah, because I think we had one of those at the Addison as well uh, that we discussed last week. Uh, yeah, the challenges of uh, remote learning, uh, have mm -hmm. fun. Yeah, you know. kids are always a step ahead of us with all of that, right? <laughs> we'll, we'll catch up. Mr. Hainer. Sorry, nothing at this time. Great. Um, and I, um, I guess, um, Ms. Tinman, what would be helpful for me, I'm still, Dr. Janger, uh, helped me with this a little bit last week, but I'm still having a hard time understanding Wednesdays. Mm -hmm. for, um, so students have, could have a club, maybe, or not. Do they have to join a club? They do not have to, but we strongly encourage everybody to, to join something. And we do have a club day coming up um, that we're organizing to make sure that all incoming students learn about all of our different clubs and what's being offered. Um, and where. So Wednesday mornings, I actually have pulled the schedule up. I thought somebody might ask about it. I have it on my desktop. Wednesday mornings um, are jam packed with our physical education classes that the majority of our students are taking place in. At 1130, every student is assigned to an advisory um, where they meet in small groups with a teacher. And again, it's a connections building, relationship building class. And then we move into um, counseling, our X block and our counseling where most seniors are working on college applications with guidance counselors and scheduling issues, any other counseling and extra help that needs to take place. 
and we have some professional development time for teachers. There's some great uh, PLCs that are going on where teachers are collaborating and sharing new tools and then staff meetings for us at the end of the day. Um, so students are engaged in, in phys ed, extra help, one-on-one -on -one counseling, and the advisory period that every student is assigned to. Great, and what are our teachers doing other than, so our phys ed teachers sound like they're very busy. Um, and our, it, all of our, many of our teachers, I presume are advisors, mm -hmm. but what are, what are they doing before 1130? Those are the times they're meeting in small groups with teachers, with students, doing some extra help sessions with students that are available. I know there was also some discussion about English teachers are working with students on their college essays during that time. If you don't have English first semester, so you're not work, having your English class right now and preparing your college essay for applications, there is a group of English teachers who are working to meet with seniors in small groups to help with that as well. So it's a lot of extra help um, and planning and collaborating with the teachers at that point. What do you think your utilization is before 1130 in terms of, you know, I, I, I don't doubt that people are working very hard and are, are meeting with students. I just, you know, it's, this is a very different way of scheduling and being than, you know, we could all understand like Wednesday last year, we all went to school on Wednesdays, right? I mean, I, I knew what students were doing. I knew what staff was doing. Um, I knew we were utilizing our, our FTEs and our time, and it was pretty clear because they were in front of kids generally, right? right? So I guess I, I'm trying to understand how we're using our, because it's still, you know, I mean, it's still Wednesday, it's still a day, right? Right, right. <laughs> so no, I understand. I'm, I'm trying to understand what our, what, what your sense is of your utilization rate, you know, um, obviously, a, a French teacher isn't teaching PE, right? right? They're maybe leading an advisory. They're not helping students with English essays. So, so I, I'm trying to understand how how we're using that time. Right. No, I understand it. it, it you know, the equity issue as well. Um, you know, are all teachers engaged in teaching and meeting with students? And so maybe that's something that we look at as finding a tracking system of really seeing who's doing what with their time and scheduling um, time a little bit different during that. I mean, I, I know we all know our teachers are engaged and are collaborating and working and planning and grading and adjusting curriculum and all of that during that time. But, but I do see, you know, and I have heard amongst other grades that it is, you know, an equity issue of who's scheduled and who's not and what are they doing. So maybe that's something we, we talk about going forward. Yeah, I think it's important to just keep talking about it. I mean, I, I don't, you know, I'm not interested in sort of coming down from, right, you know, like that. But I, I do think that, you know, this is where we can sometimes run into challenges if we have, you know, if we have English teachers who are meeting with students who don't have English on college essays, that seems like something that's like a very, 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 very high priority, right? But then, you know, it, it needs, you know, we, we need, as the school committee, we need to know that our administration is, is putting this together in a way that, that makes sense and that, you know, obviously we're, you know, we're accountable to the, to the voters and the taxpayers, so we want to make sure that we're, you know, utilizing our staff um, appropriately, but also that they, that they feel that they're being utilized appropriately is perhaps more and, and, and equitably across disciplines. So that's definitely something I, you know, I'm going to keep asking about. I haven't felt um, totally comfortable with it yet at the high school it's on Wednesdays. I, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, like I, I get that um, Wednesday still feels tough for me, um, especially there. And I don't know if it's just the lack of, of synchronous classes, which I understand why we're not doing that um, to some extent. I just, I do want to make sure that, you know, that we're, we're using our time because it is Wednesday. Mm -hmm. So it's an important day of the week. Great. Great. Thank you very much. Um, so um, Dr. Bodhi, did you want to, so as part of the, really almost a separate item, but the um, update on uh, COVID testing for staff was part of the reopening update. So would you like to give your update on that now? Um, I can, but while Ms. Sibden is still here, why don't we talk about the SATs and then back to testing? Great. Sure. Um, the high school is planning uh, to offer SATs on October 27th. Mm -hmm. um, 
in order to have been able to do that, they needed to have a uh, go ahead with the red and blue gyms, which we now have. Uh, during this period of time, there also were, came out directives from the Department of Education on the number of students that could be in a closed space, a single room, whether it was a gym or a classroom. So there's, there's needed to be uh, a series of permissions and working with um, our own Board of Health, Department of Health and Human Services, as well as the Department of Education. And all of those, um, all of that kind of discussion has taken place and we are going forward with a program so that we have uh, primarily is going to be offered in the red and the blue gym. And right now the plan is to invite those seniors who have not had a chance to take the SATs at this point. And I believe, um, uh, Ronnie, if you could correct me, I think it's about 160, 166 students. I, close to, I thought I heard even a little less. I thought maybe, 140, maybe so but you may be right. Yeah, yeah well, it's somewhere. In the ballpark. Mm -hmm. And we, we would be able to accommodate them with the plan that's been approved by the Department of Education and for Health um, in those two spaces and we'll have some uh, breakout rooms for accommodations. So this is going to happen and, and I want to congratulate the high school for all the planning has, has been necessary in order to make this happen. I don't know if you'd like to make any comments about this as well. I know you've been very involved with the very, very detailed safety plan that's in place for this program. Mm -hmm. All right. I think I just for the families out there watching, we, we really feel for the families that struggled so hard with College Board to try to find a place to have their child take the SATs this past spring, summer and fall and how many times they picked a, a site and they scheduled it and then it was canceled last minute and canceled last minute. It happened to so many families so many times. So we're really we're pushing to be able to offer it safely at Arlington High and, and we hope, fingers crossed, <laughs> all it keeps moving forward and we can do this for them. Right. And I will assure parents, they have a very, very detailed safety plan in place. Um, and that is terrific. So thank you for all your work in making this happen. No, no problem, we're happy to make it happen. And, and yes, we do have a huge safety plan as far as moving around the building, as far as mask wearing and distances amongst the desks and measuring. And we've been working on that for, for a while now. Yeah. It's quite impressive actually all the detail you've gotten down into with this plan. So we hope that it will go forward. Uh, that is, uh, that's, that's the plan right now. Great, thank you. Um, I see Mr. Thielman, Dr. Allison Ampey on the SATs. Um, Dr. Allison Ampey. Um, just a couple quick questions. First, I'm assuming the students will need to wear a mask during the entire test, okay. Um, and will, when will registration open and close? I do not have the answer to that one for you right now. Our, one of our guidance counselors, Danielle Rakowski, organizes the registration. So we need to get an update from her um, and college board now that we've kind of jumped through all the other hoops and gotten the approval with all the other organizations. So hopefully okay. as soon as possible. Right, that's, that's I think that's gonna be top on families' minds, so thank you. Um, one other detail I would add to that is that we are only allowing Arlington High School students mm -hmm. to participate in this program. Mr. Thielman? Yeah, my, my question, what, what's, the cap, what's the cap on the number of students that can sign up for this, for to take the test in October? Have you set a cap? Only the number of students that, that Dr. Bodie and I referenced that are seniors who haven't already had a chance to. So that's somewhere around the 150. That's 150. Um, ballpark, okay. yeah. Right. Well, I, you know, I wanna thank you. Um, there were lots of families that expressed mm -hmm. concern about this. And so and I think all of us forwarded a lot of, e or at least I did, I forwarded a lot of emails that came from uh, parents of students at AHS to um, the superintendent and Dr. Janker. So thanks for making this happen. You're welcome. Appreciate it. Mr. Hainer, was your question answered about- Yes, Dr. Uh, Bodie answered it at the end of her last statement. Thank you. Great, anybody else? 
Great. Um, so COVID testing for staff, Dr. Bodhi? Yes. Um, in fact, uh, it starts tomorrow. We have two sites set up in the district and teachers go through a registration process. One of the sites is Dallin and the second one is Thompson. And our plan is to continue uh, the program. Uh, I believe that what we're going to do going forward though is shift the date from Friday to Monday. And one of the reasons why we've decided on either a Friday or a Monday, but we're, we're choosing Monday is that um, we, if you push it any further into the week, then you potentially affect two cohorts, not one. And because if, if, if a teacher is tested on Monday, we don't get the results until Tuesday. But then only, only the cohort A is affected. So that's the rationale for that. I want to thank um, the partnership we have with the uh, Department of Health and Human Services. They've been terrific in supporting this program. Uh, Sydney Sheridan Curran and Sue Franke. Uh, it's taken a lot to get this program up and running, but um, we are there and it begins tomorrow. And I believe we have, uh, at least as, as of this, this morning, I think we have about 200, slightly less than that staff members who have signed up. Mr. Spiegel and then Ms. Fernandez. So it's also at Audison. So the, there's three sites tomorrow afternoon mm -hmm. that, um, so Thompson for the most of the staff and uh, the schools on that side of town, Dallin for the schools on, on that side of town, and then Audison for the Audison and, and high school staff and, and people who work at the high school. Yeah. Um, the Audison, sorry, I should have said that too. Um, Audison and Dallin are drive through, whereas the Thompson is a walk up. But people could walk up if they don't have a car. So yes. that's, yeah. Great. Thank you, Mr. Spiegel. Uh, Ms. Fernandez? Thank you. Yeah, we just wanted to say thank you from the AEA for the district for bringing the testing back. It was, you know, something that was really on the mind of many of our members um, that was really important for us. And we're so grateful for all the effort that um, went into this, particularly Cindy Curran and all the organization um, to get that back to us and, and to provide it on an ongoing basis. We, we just wanted to, to say thank you for that. Great. Thank you. Um, other members of the committee? Um, I, you know, I, we obviously, you know, think that this is really important. I'm glad that we were able to um, move this from a, a, a program that was being administered on the town side where they have um, a lot of ongoing uh, things that they're working on, not the least of which is making sure all of our students um, have access to a flu shot, which is a really, really big deal. Um, also really important, but I'm glad that um, that this was able to be sort of um, moved over under the APS umbrella. It's really, it's really important, um, and I'm glad that we're able to offer it. So thank you, Dr. Bodhi, for your work on this. Um, my only question was, is that if you're going to move to Monday, are we going to find ourselves in a situation where there's a week in which there isn't testing, or will you offer testing on a Friday and a Monday, or we don't know yet? Like, so if we're doing it this Friday, right, and then we want to move till Monday, are we going to wait 10 days to offer it again? Do you know what I'm saying? Or like, I guess that, or, or what, when you move to Monday, I, I guess I want to make sure that I understand what ongoing means. And is there going to be a sort of prolonged period when we don't, like longer than a week when we can't offer testing for our teachers? We are not offering it this coming Monday. It will be the 19th. Okay, so we're going to do it this Friday and then we're, I, I, I fully, the idea of moving it to Monday sounds like a very, very sensible idea. I can imagine from just a, um, from lots of standpoints why that makes a lot of sense. Um, so we'll do this week and then 
I guess, and next week's a short week too, right? Obviously, because there's no school. Okay, and then the 19th, lovely, oh. thank you. One of the issues is that when the results come back, which they will come back on Saturday, we have to have people that are working to do contact tracing. So it's a, it's a burden to put on the board, the, um, all of the people working on the town side because they are the, uh, the group that would be doing the contact tracing. Um, we, we certainly support that process in giving um, uh, information to help them. But nonetheless, we're putting an extra burden on the weekend for that staffing that would not be there if we started on Monday. Great. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay. Yes, Dr. Allison Ampey. Um, Just a real quick question. What will happen on uh, Monday if there's a Monday holiday? Um, we won't be having a testing that day. We can look into that issue. Um, I don't, I think for the next few, for the next few weeks, that, that doesn't happen. Uh, our next hol Monday holiday is this coming Monday. Okay, thank you very much and thank you for arranging this. Great. Um, revisions to the 2020-2021 school calendar. Um, this was, this is the second read, I believe. Um, Dr. McNeil, did you have anything that you needed to tell us? And then I'll look and see if people have questions. This is basically the same as it was two weeks ago, right? It, it, basically it is. We, uh, uh, I had a meeting with the elementary principals and Dr. Bodie, and based upon the timeline of when things are happening, um, we decided to push the conferences back into January. So the elementary conferences are now scheduled for January 6th and 13th at 1130. And then on January 7th, it will be the evening conferences from six to eight. So because it was so close to the holidays, I think that was causing um, some consternation uh, with the principals. And also, you know, looking at when the conferences are scheduled in relationship to when the progress reports go out um, so that you know pushing the conferences back will make sure that all the progress reports are received and then parents have a chance to review them and then be able to um, attend the conferences so it, it had to do with the holidays and looking at the timing of the progress reports and making sure that parents all parents got the receive the progress reports can review them and then be prepared to ask questions during the conferences. So it just alleviates some of that stress. So we felt like we, we should push the conferences back into January. All right, Any? Uh, so I'm looking for a motion on the calendar. Mr. Schlickman. Uh, I'll move to adopt the calendar as presented and request to speak on it. Second. Mr. Schlickman. Uh, I have a question in that last year we were looking at different forms of the calendar and we saw some other districts with some really nice calendars that look promising. Uh, I'm wondering where we are on that effort to change the format and appearance. I don't think we're anywhere any further than we were last year that, that has sort of gone down to the bottom of the list. <laughs> uh, I think that down the road, we might be able to uh, resurrect some planning on that. Thank you. Anybody else on the calendar? Seeing nobody on a motion by Mr. Schlickman, second by Mr. Hainer, I think, right? Um, the revisions to the 2020-2021 school calendar. Um, Ms. Exton. I couldn't hear you actually. Yeah. You heard? Oh, good. All right, perfect. Mr. Cardin. Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Mr. Schlickman. Yes. Mr. Hainer. Yes. And I'm also yes. Um, 
APS hiring update. So, um, Mr. Spiegel, I'm going to have you do, um, I think we should talk about them. We can do questions separately, but uh, you have the floor for um, hiring as well as the diversity hiring report. Yes, thank you. Can I show, see if I can share? Yeah. Um, okay. So, I'm just going to share a couple slides here. And so this is just an update since two weeks ago. Um, we've had some new hires. A couple of these people have, are, haven't started yet, but we've, um, they've been onboarded and are ready to start, I think next week, uh, an Audis in Spanish teacher and a special education teacher at Brackett. And then we've just this week hired two nurses, one uh, for the preschool to replace someone who had resigned and then another one-to-one -one nurse for a student who needs one-to-one -one nursing support. Um, we've hired a lot of paraprofessionals in the last two weeks. That's been the majority of our hiring um, and the majority of positions we still need to hire. So include, you can see the TAs for elementary remote academy, all, Preschool, Stratton, Hardy, Gibbs, Audison, Dallin, and Brackett. So we're still, um, we still have some vacancies. Um, basically, we have teaching assistants and building subs at Bishop, Pierce, uh, Stratton, Hardy, Remote Academy um, that we're still looking for. We still have a couple of Title I literacy tutors. Um, we the, those were kind of late postings just because the title one budget is always uh, the grant is always it was a little bit late this year with with our how, knowing how much we would have um so we do we're looking to fill those positions um the math instructional support paraprofessionals um, i think we're about to hire elementary reading teacher we're still looking for and um uh, ahs has a paraprofessional that supports students in um, credit recovery and we're looking to fill that position due to a recent vacancy. And so that's, um, that's really the hiring update. Um, let me stop the sharing there. Um, did you want me to take questions now on that? Let's do the diversity hiring and then do questions on all. Okay. I think that makes sense. Okay, so the diversity report for this year. So, um, you know, I, I always like to start with the student data. One of the things I was looking for, and I don't know if Dr. Bodie or Dr. McNeil know the answer. I mean, we definitely have a reduction in student numbers for, from our October 1. These are really preliminary October 1 numbers. Um, they haven't done any of the final, finalizing those reports yet, but, um, so we obviously have a reduction in students. I, I believe that part of that is due to students and families who decided um, because of the, the pandemic to either go to private school or homeschool. And I don't know if Dr. McNeil or Dr. Bodie know if that's the case. Um, so you can see the, the, you know, the, the makeup of the students in, um, in Arlington, I mean, uh, with still predominantly white, but increasing uh, diversity um, in, in some of uh, the other populations. Uh, some of the, the Asian um, population has, is, there's actually been a decrease in numbers in most of the categories from, from last year, um, just because of the overall decrease. Um, for all employees, um, again, this is, we haven't moved a lot in this. We're still predominantly a white employee, uh, have predominantly white employees in our district. Um, at least 80%, probably a little bit more because of the, the numbers that are not reporting. Um, it's always hard to capture 100% of the data of um, when, when employees are asked to self-disclose. Um, so 
a large number do not report. So I'm guessing based on our numbers that the majority of those are, are would be considered um, white employees. Um, so the numbers have increased a little bit from last year in the numbers of Asian and black and Hispanic employees. Um, so th th there's a little bit of an increase. Um, the new hires from the last year, from 10-1 last year to September 30th of this year, you can see the total, um, uh, the total numbers of, of employees, 101 white employees, 16 who didn't identify, 10 Hispanic, 11 black, and seven Asian. For the AEA, again, the numbers have not moved a whole lot. Um, in the, the percentages, we still are having a, some challenges attracting a, a, a large number of applicants and hires who, especially in the teaching employees who are, um, who do identify as black or, or Hispanic or Asian. We have, um, the Audison actually was one of the schools actually that was able to, to hire, um, some additional uh, employees in in those categories this year. Um, so there, there are some more some more teachers in, in in the school who are identified as Black, Asian, or Hispanic. All new hires or AEA new hires since last year. Um, these are the numbers. Um, and again, it's just uh, small numbers in each um, of the um, Asian, Black, and Hispanic categories. For paraprofessionals, we do, um, we, we have hired, been able to attract a little bit more diversity. Um, we do have a few more um, paraprofessionals who are Asian, Black, and Hispanic than in our, um, in our teaching force and in the AA Unit A. And then AAA, I mean, this is sort of a catch-all of all administrators and principals, central office, IT. Um, and those numbers haven't changed a lot. There haven't been a lot of hires um, new uh, in those categories in the last year. I mean, there's, there have been some, and obviously we hired um, Madame uh, Pierre Maxwell at Gibbs. So um, that increases a little bit of our um, representation in our administrative team. Um, Arlington After School actually had a reduction in employees this year because of the, the numbers of students attending and uh, staff needs. So we actually, had, for the first time in several years, have fewer employees in the after school um, than, we did, um, than we did in the past few years because we've been growing those programs so much over the past several years and, and this is really kind of a dip this year, but they have had historically um, strong representation. Um, and this year that has dipped a little bit just because of some of the um, employees who either chose not to return or they didn't have a position for. Again, again the numbers for maintenance, transportation and food service, um, those numbers again are a little bit um, better in terms of representation in uh, Asian employees, Black employees, and Hispanic employees um, for, for those groups. And then the overall breakdown between staff and students, um, you know, the students are the blue column. And so, you know, we are definitely overrepresented among staff, among white, white staff compared to the students. And um, some of the areas where we are, you know, you know the Asian students um, do not see the, their enough representation, especially in the classroom, as we would like, um, and, and the Black students and Hispanic students as well. But you can see the disparities um, are stronger, um, you know, higher disparity in the Asian population. And that is that report. So, you know, overall, I mean, we, we're doing a lot of the things we've been doing with our um, our involvement in 
Mass Partnership for Diversity in Education, a lot of um, the groups that we all are members of as, you know, with the HR directors and the superintendents and assistant superintendents and the principals all meet in their cohorts. Um, all of the meetings are virtual now, but um, I think we all share a lot of the same challenges and concerns and try to get ideas from our peers of what they're doing in other districts to attract um, more diverse staff, especially in, in teachers. And uh, I think a lot of districts are facing those challenges and we are trying to post in different places and we post on School Spring and uh, Talent Ed is our um, application portal. And we've also, I've been posting a lot more recently on Indeed to try to get more applicants um, and on LinkedIn. We just uh, started a new account, kind of a trial on LinkedIn job postings. We've been able to attract some, some candidates through that. We do, I need to work on that a little bit more. Um, so there, there's some different things we're doing. I've been meeting periodically over the last couple months with members of the high school um, group um, that's sort of a subcommittee of the, I think a subcommittee of the Black Student Union that is focused on diversity. This subcommittee is specifically focused on diversity in, um, in the staff and the teaching force. And we've been, you know, I've been meeting with them and I think some of the other administrators have too. So we can get ideas from them and they can sort of understand our processes a little better. So it's the first time, you know, that I've been here that I've really had that kind of engagement with students in this area. So, I mean, that's, that's about it. I mean, I think um, I'm open to questions. Great, thank you so much, Mr. Spiegel. Um, questions, I see Mr. Hainer, I see Dr. Allison Ampey, um, so I see Ms. Exton. So Ms. Exton, you can start. Thank you. Um, so one of my questions was was answered, but um, you know, as, as you all know, the conversation a lot in the community has been around hiring a more diverse staff, um, more representation for our students. Um, you know, and you shared about that, the challenges and how it's something that's happening um, in a lot of uh, communities in the Commonwealth. Um, so my first question was, what strategies were, are you using to hire um, more teachers and staff? And you shared um, a lot about that. And I think the involvement um, with the high school group really speaks to sort of the need um, that students are feeling and expressing around wanting to be themselves in, in their teachers and in their educators. Um, so I hope that, you know, we can continue to work towards this. I would have liked to have seen these numbers higher. I'm sure yeah. this year, especially um, hiring teachers at all has been challenging, I know, sir. So I, yeah. I see yeah. that. Um, my question is, um, how, what's the, the retention rate like what do we do once we have hired um, teachers of color like what strategies do we have to make sure that they stay so that that the number of staff can go up even if we're if it's a slow yeah. growth yeah i mean i think you know one of the things we do is we have a strong mentoring program in the district our curriculum directors who hire um, spend a lot of time with um, teachers in their departments. Um, there, there have been um, sort of informal affinity groups um, with teachers of color and staff of color in the district that they have gotten together um, on, on occasions um, throughout the, the years. Um, you know, one of the things I will say is we actually did lose a couple teachers this past year who resigned. Um, who went to Cambridge. We lost a, a couple teachers of color to, to Cambridge for different reasons. One is they make more money in Cambridge. And, um, you know, it's just something we, um, that might not have been the only reason. There may have been other professional opportunities they were looking for there that, um, you know, something 
different, or maybe I'm not exactly sure. I'd have to go back and look at my notes from the exit interviews, but um, it is sort of a challenge where you kind of feel like, um, you know, we, those are teachers, uh, like any, all the teachers, we, you know, put time and effort into the mentoring and everything. And uh, it's disappointing when they, when they leave. So, um, you know, we try to retain, we can't retain every teacher, unfortunately. And, um, you know, I think we need to sort of look again at that and maybe, you know, I, I know um, it's going to be a challenging year this year and you know, we'll, you know, I don't want to get into contract negotiations here, but the, the salaries are just one area that may be an issue, something we can look at. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, you talked about affinity groups. I, when I think about, you know, if, if teachers feel supported and see themselves in other staff members, mm -hmm. then they know other people and, um, you know, can reach out to their communities to, to bring more, you know, building on that from making the, the teachers of color that do work here feel like they belong and they are supported and they have um, peers that um, in the in the schools um, that they work with that they can you know connect with such that then more will want to come so just I appreciate the work that they're doing and the way you're thinking about it and just yeah. encouraging um, us to continue to work on that so thank, thank you, you. And I I think Dr. McNeil has been involved. Um, you know, a lot has changed with the pandemic with everyone being so busy with so many things and meetings all the time. But I think pre-pandemic, there were periodic meetings with um, staff of color in the district. Yes, there was. Um, and pre-pandemic, I uh, reached out to staff of color. Uh, this is actually, I think it was a year ago. And uh, at the beginning of, I'm getting my years <laughs> merging together, uh, like two years ago, you know, we started a formal, like right now we have our staff of color, they meet informally. Uh, but then I reached out to staff of color and we start meeting formally. And at that particular point in time, I think, you know, just, you know, when you, when you talk about meeting, getting groups of individuals together, I had to you know, we, we got together and I had an outside consultant actually come in and you know, kind of help with forming the group and identifying a structure and a purpose and coming up with a, an objective. And so you, you would have a, a way of directing the group so it's seen to be very um, beneficial for why people were meeting. And I think what came into, there was a problem there with me leading the group my positional, you know, as assistant superintendent, it was seeing that people didn't, it, it got to be, it, it ran to be a, it came to be a, a somewhat of a problem. And so my, my plan was to work and hire an outside consultant to come in pre pandemic to kind of take on that role of leading the group, consulting with the group. And then they would be like a liaison to me and Kathy moving forward. Um, but then the pandemic hit and then our focus kind of shifted to just <laughs> providing instruction for students and shifting the curriculum and being able to do that. So, you know, as we get more into this year, I, I do plan on to continue that, um, that initiative and that pathway to trying to find a way to formulate a structured activities and having the staff of color come to come together in a formal way. Um, and then like looking outside as an outside person to come in because there are certain things that, you know, staff members want to discuss that they don't necessarily want the assistant superintendent to be privy to, even though I'm a person of color. I think there are still some things that, you know, when you think about administrator, administrators working with teachers, you always have to take a look at that dynamic as to what things people feel comfortable sharing. And then you look at your position, even though I don't look at it as, as that way, but people still view me as, you know, the assistant superintendent. So I think that came into play and there are certain things that they didn't want to disclose to me. And so I, I think that that was a, a problem with that. So, like I said before, I still think that it's something that we need to pursue and, you know, still have that opportunity for staff of color to come together and do it in a very structured and formal way 
And so they can see that as, as a benefit. So that's something I learned from the situation, um, you know, after going through it. And I, and I feel like that, that is something that we need to do. And I also want to, again, I want to chime in is that, you know, also one of the challenges of hiring people of color in a majority white district is that, you know, many of the, and this is part of my doctoral work, is that after, you know, exploring this and researching this, this uh, topic, you know, a lot of people of color want to go back to the district where they were actually in school. So we have like, you know, we have Boston, we have Cambridge, which has much more diverse uh, population of students. And that's, you know, for people of color, you know, that was some of the feedback that we got, like, why did you come back to this particular district? And in various districts that have, you know, a diverse population of students, that is where, that is a, a reason why they, they want to come back and they want to give back to those particular districts. So it's, it's just a, another added challenge attracting people of color to come to a majority white district when you look at the staff that's majority white and the students are majority white and some of those you know individuals want to go back to the district where they went to school so they can give back and that they that you know fulfills their you know from an, an intrinsic standpoint that that fulfills their that's more fulfilling for them not that they wouldn't come to a all-white district it's that they want to give back to where they went to school so that's another dynamic that we're competing with as we as we try to you know up you know, uh, address this, this topic, this issue. So that's food for thought. Mr. Hayner. Uh, going back to the, uh, the hiring and stuff, I'm really concerned by the number, the numbers that you brought forward that uh, we've had a reduction in students, not asking for it now, but I'd like to hear at a, another meeting of why, why those students and what the breakdown is, at what levels we lost that many students. I think that's the biggest loss we've ever had. It may be because of pandemic, I don't know, but I think that's something we need to find out. Thank yeah, you. And I, I will say, I just asked our data specialist for the numbers um, the other day, and it was just, I mean, we're, you know, those are October 1, very preliminary, and I don't know if they will, I don't know if they're the final numbers that, there may be some changes, um, so I, I'm not sure. But, but that's dramatic and it's gonna have an impact on uh, state funding and things of that nature. If there is a reason beyond pandemic, I think we need to know about it. Thank you. Well, I, I, can, I can also say that, you know, looking at the number of parents who are opting into the homeschooling and, you know, you know sending in applications, I'm, I'm getting, you know, they're starting to die down a little bit, but it's still trickling in like three or four coming in at a time. And, you know, parents even comment when they're, you know, submitting their applications, like the reason is, is the pandemic. And they feel that they want to take charge of their uh, students' education. And they, and, you know, we have certain parents in our community who have the resources and they've actually established like a pod where they have hired their own teacher and a group of parents get together and they they chip in and, and those they send their there's those students to that particular educator I think it's and, important for us to know if that's the answer then that's fine but if it's not we need to know that's all thank you well, well I'm, I'm, I'm giving you kind of like a and I will have a, a more formal homeschooling okay. report but I think that that the pandemic has a large okay. is a large uh, reason for that yeah um it is a large reason for it. We, we don't know where, um, well, certainly I can give you the homeschool report, but uh, the Department of Education is aware of the same issue. And I, I think our concern is also about funding, but there is some discussion going on as to how that's going to be handled uh, in terms of analysis. This is not unique to Arlington right now. And we'll, Will um, the will be a multi-year average used? Will they use last year's numbers? Uh, all this yet to be determined. And I will say as an antidote that, you know, in those particular letters that I get from parents, they're very apologetic. And they also say, they also state that, you know, when the pandemic is over, we plan to have our 
students come back to the district. So in the, and it, you know, again, these are just based upon what I've received through the homeschooling application process. Other, you know, reasons why, you know, certain parents may pull their students out may differ, but this is what I'm getting from the, app, the homeschool application process. Dr. Allison Ampey. Thanks. Um, my original question got kind of preempted by um, Ms. Exton and Mr. Spiegel's dialogue, but I just want to, I'm going to read a quote. Um, I was also going to ask about affinity groups. Um, and I want to read the quote that I had for that. It's from Beverly Dan Daniel Tatum's book, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria? Um, and I'm reading it because I think it's in favor, it explains another reason or it gives more background for, for why it can be helpful. Um, she writes, some corporate leaders have found that such interventions, sometimes called infinity groups or employee resource groups, particularly when championed by a senior executive, support the recruitment and retention and heightened pr productivity of their employees. A company-sponsored resource group can be an institutional affirmation of the unique challenges facing historically marginalized employees of color. And I'm glad if we're considering um, figuring out how to set this up formally, my understanding was it was more for networking and connection and interaction, um, but in whatever way it can be set up, I think it could be helpful. And I think it could both help enhance our recruitment of diverse teachers, but also that it could be of interest and benefit to them. Thank Absolutely, 100% agree with you. Great, uh, Mr. Thielman. Yeah, on the uh, affinity group, um, what, one of the things that um, happens in other industries, uh, and it may happen in other school districts, I don't even know, is that uh, a, a, the person who chairs the affinity group gets a stipend, uh, and it's often, uh, you know, so someone on the staff who takes over this responsibility gets a little uh, extra pay to run the group, coordinate the group, coordinate activities, meetings, that sort of thing. So something to consider as we do some planning on this. Absolutely, thank you. I, you know, I did consider that as well, but you know, when you put somebody in charge again within the, within the district, they kind of lose out on the benefit as being part of the group. And, I know. and, and, and so that's, those are all, these are all very good ideas and I, and I definitely appreciate them. And I, I will just, we're gonna continue to do it and we will make it work. Um, this is something that I'm committed to. And I think that, you know, Dr. Bodie and, you know, uh, all the people in central office were committed to making this happen. So I, I think that we all understand the benefit and we just got to make sure that we do it properly and that, and that you know, people who are going to participate, they see a benefit in it as well. So I, I do appreciate all the, the suggestions and keep them coming. Yeah. I've had people say to me who work in with my colleagues say, uh, colleagues of color that, you know, I'm, I'm very tired of being the person that has to carry the ball <clears throat> in this kind of work. So don't call on me again. So I get it. Mr. Cardin. Hi, thanks. Um, so I want to go back to the, the general hiring report and um, there's, there's no numbers in the number of positions that are unfilled, but it, you know, it looks like it's concentrated in paraprofessionals. And I guess my, my issue is that you know we're three weeks into the school year. We you know we're, we've milked most applicant applicants that we can get, um, but we're not fully staffed. We're not able to run our school system. Um, so I, I think what we need from you, uh, Dr. Bodie and Mr. Spiegel, is is an analysis of where we're still short and how we're going to cover that. I mean maybe maybe we need to do a hiring bonus, and obviously that's subject to union negotiation. But if we pay that that you know thousand dollars to all of the people in that unit, um, you know if that's what we need to do to staff up, then then we need to hear that, um, and we need to see if we have the money to do that. Um, but uh, you know I, I, we're already three weeks in, and I just don't know where how we're going to be able to run the system like this going forward. Thanks. Yeah, I mean I would say one of the issues we have is that we are, you know. The, 
there's so many needs and every kind of need to work together. And what I've been trying to do is sort of do general postings and sort of get the applicants and um, and distribute them to the administrators to, to review and, and bring in. We also, I mean, one of the differences this year is we need remote TAs. Um, and we've hired several, we still need to hire a few more. So that sort of takes away from the pool that can work inside, in person in the schools. Um, you know, one of the things we've done, we've been able, to, because there was a reduction in the after school staff, we've been able to hire a few of them for in, uh, both in person and remote teaching assistant positions. Um, so that's been one area that we've been able to um, sort of not lose those employees altogether. Um, and you know we're still continuing to post still continuing to use our, our networks and uh you know you're right i mean i think but this is again not only an arlington issue i think a lot of districts are dealing with this uh these challenges of hiring enough paraprofessionals right now all right anybody else on hiring mr schuchman yeah, I mean, this is uh, uh, an aside, really, from the issue of the enrollment. Uh, just one thing in terms of the report, we we expressed the the students in terms of number of students and all, all the other data was expressed in percentages and be helpful for comparisons to have the same metric going across. But that said, <coughs> it appears we have a 2.6% drop in enrollment this year uh, as opposed to last year. Now I know that there, there are going to be out of district placements that aren't, might not be counted in this right now. So that number is going to go up. Uh, but uh, this is very concerning because our chapter 70 increases have been based on uh, the enrollment above the number that triggers uh, foundation budget increases. Uh, so I'd like to have a report at the next meeting, if we can, exactly what the uh, change in enrollment is for this year and the impact potentially on Chapter 70 uh, for the subsequent year, because even if we're held harmless at last year's numbers, that doesn't have the enrollment growth that has been uh, sustaining our budget. Uh, I also want to say I'm very appreciative of Dr. McNeil's expertise in, in, in the area of uh, supporting uh, staff of color uh, and that we're indeed fortunate that his graduate work is in this area and we're blessed by uh, his, his skill and knowledge in terms of supporting these teachers. So I just wanted to add some thanks here. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Great. Anybody else? Okay, thank you, Mr. Spiegel. Thank you, Dr. McNeil. Um, community Relations School Committee chats, Mr. Hainer. Hopefully I'm gonna do something historic and be brief. We had a meeting uh, last week with the Community Relations. Uh, we talked about reestablishing uh, School Committee chat in a virtual reality. And we came up with, and I asked my uh, other members of the committee to correct me if I make any misstatements, the idea of meeting on Saturdays uh, for one hour, again, 11 o'clock, that's what it was done historically, setting up a virtual uh, meeting place, uh, setting five minutes for speakers. And one of the things that we talked about is separating it out into an elementary meeting, a METCO meeting, and a secondary meeting. Not that other people can't come at those times, three, three Saturdays a month, uh, to determine it. I spoke to uh, Ms. Thomas about having the separate METCO one. She said she had, and we discussed it too, mixed feelings about separating them. She said initially, give it a shot to see what happens. But that doesn't mean that other people, that they can't come at other times. We suggested having three meetings, uh, two in November and one in December, and then reconvene to, to, uh, to assess the uh, efficacy of doing it, number one, continue to do it throughout the rest of the year, 
and number two, to see if it, it was uh, worthwhile having separate meetings for Metco. Um, we uh, came up with some basic guidelines. One of the questions that came up that was of concern was, since we're now doing it virtual, or we're proposing to do it virtual, whether the open meeting law would restrict us. I reached out to town council and he stated as long as not a quorum was present, and our intent is to not have more than two members of the committee at a time, and we're not doing any deliberation, then this would be considered office hours and basically getting input from the public and not making decisions. Um, and he said, and our concern with that was that the possibility of inhibiting it by having to record it and things of that nature. He said that is not necessary as long as we stay within those uh, first two guidelines, non-quorum and non-deliberation. So um, if the committee is willing to support this going forward, I will send out a uh, basic uh, uh, outline of dates um, and looking to get uh, three, I, I'm willing to sign up for, to be present on all of them. Um, and that means I'm asking you to sit with me for a whole hour by yourself. So I know that's gonna be tough. You'll get extra pay in your envelope at the end of the year if you go through with it. Uh, again, we're going to assess it uh, again in December to see if whether we're going forward and how many more meetings there will actually be. So, be willing to, if I left anything out, I would ask uh, Mr. Thielman and Ms. Exton to correct any of my boo boos. Great. Um, so, do you? I, I don't know. Do you want a motion on this, Mr. Hainer? What do you think? I, like, because if to set it as office hours, does it need to be like a meeting? Do you, what, what do you, we, what we, makes sense? We, I don't think so, right? According to council, this is not an official school committee meeting. It's considered office hours. I don't know the legal, the legal distinction is we're not required to meet all the measures of the open meeting law. Great, okay. Uh, so we probably don't need a motion, but is there any discussion about any discussion, um, Mr. Cardin? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think if the school committee wants to hold office hours, we should have a, a motion to do this. Um, so I move that we hold the office hours as recommended by Mr. Hainer. Um, and I'll pause for a second. I'll second for purpose of discussion. And then, um, I mean, I, was, I didn't attend the community relations meeting. So presumably it was discussed. I think this is more meetings than we used to do because you split it. Um, and I guess I'm, you know, since you're volunteering to take all of them, <laughs> that that lightens the burden for the rest of us. So I'm, I'm okay with that. I think it's a lot of time, but we'll see how it goes. My only other comment is when we advertise them, we need to make clear that this is, you know, it's not a one-on-one -on -one meeting. This is, you know, it's gonna be by Zoom. There's gonna be, you know, five or six other people on the line when they're telling us, um, uh, when they're giving us, you know, their feedback. Um, whereas when we were at the cafes, um, we could often, all, we, could, we could take turns with people and there'd be a little bit more privacy. So, um, uh, so it, as long as people know the situation and also reiterate that, you know, we generally can't get involved in personnel matters or somebody's grade is, you know, needs to be adjusted or things like that. I think is helpful in, in setting the tone. Um, I think the old materials that Jennifer used for hers were, were, were good in describing what the purpose was. I, I put in the package uh, a set of a draft uh, thing of guidelines and basically talk uh, the idea of bringing things that they, they I began off with a statement of uh, things that are going well in the system before we get to things of concern. The other thing that was mentioned is the possibility of doing breakout rooms. But I, in, initially, I'd like to try the general. I appreciate what you said. We have to let people know that this is going to be basically an open forum um, in communicating this. I appreciate that. Mr. Schlickman? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I know where Mr. Hayner is coming from in terms of doing this because he was online with a lot of the focus groups for the superintendent search. And these worked extremely well. Uh, and they were very informal. Uh, people were just 
coming in and conversing at the time, and 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 I like the spirit of that. If I may, uh, uh, I'm thinking about the way this should be set forth uh, it, to to sort of change the motion a little it, to authorize the community relations committee to schedule. Uh, uh, schedule and implement uh, these forums uh, at dates and times of their choosing. I accept the amendment. Mm -hmm. Second. Great. Any more discussion? Just that we will be coming back to you in December uh, with a, a report whether we're going forward or not. Great. And Dr. Allison Ampey? I think this is a good idea to have the forums, but I, like Mr. Cardin, am also concerned that you're potentially talking about a lot of time. And even if you're taking up one of the seats, it's still a lot of time. Um, and that part of the reason it kind of fell by the wayside before was that we didn't actually have the audience um, so I think we can see, I'm, I don't know that I would support three meetings a month going forward, but we can talk when, after the first set. I would agree with that. I think it's, we all felt it was a, is a lot to do, but, uh, if the showing is good, we go forward. If it's not going, we can always reassess it throughout the year as we did the, the initially. Anybody else? Great. So on uh, Mr. Cardin's motion amended by Mr. Schlickman, seconded by Mr. Hainer. Um, Ms. Exton? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Hainer? Yes. And I am also yes. Great. Thank Anything else on that, Mr. Hainer? You all set? Nope. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Um, Dr. Bodie, superintendent's report. Thank you, Ms. Morgan. I, I really have one thing, and that is an update on the high school. Since you're not meeting there, you can't see all of that's been going on, but it is moving forward. Uh, things are going are on time. And this week we sent out uh, the sub bids, all the bids, and we should know in November how well the bids match budget. The other thing is that we are um, looking to see what kind of groundbreaking ceremony we might have. Uh, we don't know if we will actually do it now or wait till other significant um, points in the project. But Traditionally, when you begin construction, which is a technically what we're doing very soon, even though it seems like we've been under construction, is to have a groundbreaking ceremony with MSBA, the building committee, the school committee, board of selectmen, um, and our OPM are in discussion, our OPMs are in discussion with MSBA as to uh, what that will look like now in the the light of our current crisis. So I'll be more, we we'll back to you more on that. Um, a milestone that will be happening toward the end of November, early December is the first steel going up. So that's basically where we are. It's all going forward. And the one thing I will um, just add to this is people have asked now that the students are not in the school, can we accelerate what we're doing? And the answer is no. It, it's the, the students in the school really have no effect on the schedule at this time. That's it. Great, thank you, Dr. Bodhi. Any questions or comments or feedback on that? Okay, seeing none. 
Um, the consent agenda, all items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Vote approval of warrant, warrant number 21065 dated 929-2020, total amount $599,641.65. Uh, vote approval of job description, social and emotional learning coach job description. Okay. All right, do we have a motion? I mean, uh, yeah. So move. Second. Um, okay. Um, Ms. Exton? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Hainer? Yes. And I am also yes. Um, subcommittee and liaison reports and announcements. Budget, Dr. Kersey, uh, Dr. Allison Ampey? I will be in touch this week. We need to set up a meeting to start thinking about the FY22 budget. Um, Community relations, Mr. Hainer. We are going to have our next meeting on October 16th at 4.30. CIA, Mr. Cardin. Thanks. So we had uh, two meetings last week. Um, most of you were, were at, <laughs> at both of them, but um, for those who don't, it weren't in the public as well. Um, the first one was with the Board of Health um, at the town, the Arlington Department of Health, along with the chair of the Board of Health. Um, staff from the uh, department and then the appointed chair of the Board of Health was there, who is a, a medical doctor. Uh, we went over the testing program, which we've already gotten an update on. We also um, talked about um, both the relationship between the, uh, the APS Director of Nursing and the nursing staff and the Board of Health and um, uh, got a little more insight into that. Dr. Bodhi meets with the um, uh, Christine, Christine Bongiorno, who is the Director of Health and Human Services as part of the emergency management team every day. So there's ongoing communication uh, and then there's staff level communication as to certain issues. Um, one example that we went through was the, the, the standard for quarantining um, students who, who may be um, exposed to somebody in a school. Um, we, the Department of Health made the determination that um, to go beyond the DESE standards. So instead of trying to determine which students were actually in, within, within six feet of somebody else for more than 15 minutes, which is a DESE standard, because they're in the same class for six hours or more a day, um, uh, if there is a case, then the whole class would be quarantined for the 14 days. So it, it is a more conservative standard. It's the standard that most school systems are going with, but it's, it, it is more conservative than the DESE standard. And we did clarify that that was determined by the Department of Health with input from our staff as well. And then finally, we discussed the health metrics issue. Um, some other districts have set forth metrics that they'll use to either, um, just metrics that they're watching to see you know, how things are going or metrics that they'll use to determine that it's time to switch to remote or it's, it's time to um, uh, switch back to hybrid. Um, our, the recommendation from the, the Arlington Board of Health is that um, uh, they look at it more holistically. They are, there's certain, they're, they're, they are looking at the state report, which comes out every Wednesday, yellow, red, green ratings, um, but they're also looking at it in a whole other set of data. They're also looking qualitatively. So for example, in Middleton, Middleton is in the red zone right now because they have an outbreak at a prison. Um, but so that, that wouldn't necessarily be the right decision to follow just the metric because all, of, all, all the cases but one are in the, in the prison. So um, we heard from them and, and, and we'll, there'll be communication going forward as the data changes and, and things either get worse or get better. Um, the second meeting was more focused on the issue we had with the reassignments of students in the remote academy that we discussed at our last meeting. We did explore it in more detail uh, with the staff. Um, uh, we learned that, you know, they were trying to put keep people in their home school. Uh, as the numbers came in, they were, they were able to sort of, the classes sort of self-formed the way it was described. So there would be enough students at Dallin, for example, to have 
one remote class per grade. There was actually a little bit of overflow at Dallin, um, but those classes were, were sort of arranged that way. Um, and then they went back and tried to, to cover the, the um, inclusion services. And it was clear at some point that that, that, that just wasn't gonna be able to, to, to happen because the students who needed those services were scattered in all, all of the remote classrooms rather than being concentrated as they normally are. Um, so um, the staff apologized again. Um, we, we will, you know, going forward, learn from this mistake. And, um, you know, certainly we apologize again to the families that were affected. So that's, that was our, on our plate last week. We are gonna meet again, uh, hopefully next week. Um, we, we do need to work on uh, some form of evaluation for the superintendent. Uh, we do have to get back to the Arlington Human Rights Commission to meet with them on the issues they raised over the summer. Uh, and uh, we're available if the, uh, Dr. Janger would like to present any of his stuff um, before he presented to the full committee. Um, we're also available for that. Thank you. Great, thank you, Mr. Cardin. Uh, facilities, Mr. Thielman. Uh, we're trying to schedule a meeting sometime next week before the 16th when the district's report is due to the school committee. And um, so I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll have it scheduled hopefully by tomorrow, end of the day, we'll know our time and date for next week. Uh, policy, Mr. Schlickman? Uh, no report. And superintendent search process? There we have a report. Uh, tomorrow at 3 p.m. is the deadline for uh, interested people to apply for the position of superintendent of schools. Uh, the screening committee will meet next Thursday to uh, evaluate the candidacies that are brought before us and plan for interviews through the month of October. Uh, we are also assembling a uh, bank of questions that we will be using in the first round of interviews. Uh, and that's the report for superintendent search. Thank you, Mr. Shipman. Um, high school building committee, Mr. Thielman, we heard from Dr. Bodie. I don't know if you have anything else. No, I have nothing. We, you know, one thing is, you know, the par mentor is open. Um, and so uh, we're, we're trying to organize a tour of the high school building committee in small groups uh, to see both the well, as Dr. Bodie said, the site and the prime mentors. So I think maybe once we do that, maybe we can talk about a school committee trip there too, once the building committee gets there, gets in there. Great, thank you. Um, liaison reports, announcements, uh, Mr. Hainer. Uh, the Rotary Club of Arlington will be doing its annual Flags for Heroes. Obviously, it's not going to be flags are not going out in front of the high school. They're going to be up at the Park Circle Water Tower. Uh, and thanks to Mr. Lundstrom from the Workplace Program, his students will again help the old fogies put the flags up on October 22nd at 12 at 11:30. Thank you. Great. Um, future agenda items, Mr. Schlickman. Uh, two items. One, we received uh, a notice from MASC that we have not designated uh, a delegate for the delegate assembly, which will be virtually held in November. So I'd like to ask that we put that on the agenda for the next meeting. And I'd also like to just get a report at the next meeting of where we stand on the Arlington High mascot issue. Great, Mr. Hainer. Uh, if possible, I'd like to have some sort of a financial uh, report on the effects COVID has had on us and where we may be going forward, if we're gonna have, have to go to the town or whatever. Thank you. And Mr. Hainer, was the format of the report that Mr. Mason prepared with the, the one that was sort of, it was a result of a request from Mr. Schlickman, is that sort of what you're looking for or something different? I just want to make sure that we give Mr. Mason that he knows what we're looking for. I'm not sure if that covers it. I, I'm, I'm concerned about, we have a, uh, we, we, we made a regular budget last year. We brought it before the town meeting. Our expenses are going forward. Uh, Mr. Cardin mentioned the possibility of us having to offer hiring bonuses and things like that. 
I'd like to know where we stand right now. If that report works, it's fine. If it doesn't, I leave that to Mr. Mason. He knows the numbers. Are you good with that, Mr. Mason, or do you need any more from us? No. I'm good. I'm good. Thank okay. you. All right. Anything else? Mr. Carden. Sorry, so that reminds me that, it, that it's for liaison reports. We did have a meeting of the Long Range Planning Committee since the last meeting. Um, so three of us were there, but not everyone. So uh, basically it was just an update on, um, you know, where, where the town plan stands. Um, you know, we, we did get more um, money in uh, state aid than, than based, well, if, if, the, if the promise of the governor and the House and Senate holds, and that they all three promised this, um, assuming that holds, then we will get more money in state aid than we had planned for in the spring, in the late spring, um, or whenever town meeting was over the, over, the, over the summer. So, but that's sort of, that additional money has been offset by declines in, expected declines in local revenue, the meals tax and the auto excise tax. So, um, you know, overall, uh, you know, we'll, 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 we'll stay in touch. Uh, we'll meet again in December or so, but for now, there's no no crisis for this fiscal year on the on the town side. Um, but going forward, things might be difficult. Great, thank you, Mr. Cardin. Well, not great, but thank you for the report. Um, anything else? Liaison reports, announcements, future agenda items. Going once, twice. Okay. Um, motion to adjourn. No move. No executive session. We, do we need executive session tonight, Mr. Spiegel? Uh, no, but yeah. we will next time. Okay, but not. Yeah. You don't need it I, I, I wasn't ready for it tonight, so but I, I will be next time. Okay. All right. Um, great. I'll talk to you about it next later. Okay. Um, so do we have a second on adjournment? Second. Great. Um, Ms. Exton. Yes. Mr. Cardin. Yes. Dr. Alice Nampi. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Mr. Schlickman. Yes. Mr. Hainer. Yes. And I am also yes. Thank you very much. Thank you um, to everybody for coming. Been vivid. Have a good, good night. Good night, my friends.